for us. Thank you very much. Then welcome everyone to the November 5th Select Board meeting. And before we get to public comment, I just want to mention two things. One, uh, thanks to everyone for the good wishes for my father for when I was not here last time. He had been in a bad accident and he's getting much better and uh, the community support uh, has been just wonderful. And so on behalf of him and my whole family, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Ms. Stein for running the meeting so well in my absence. Yes, and uh, to everyone else for taking up the slack during that meeting. Um, the first thing before we get to public comment tonight is Mr. Musanti has a special, uh, a special thing to, uh, to tell us about and introduce us to. Uh, yes, thank you. And um, we have a special uh, presentation tonight uh, related to uh, some uh, good deeds and heroism on the part of young people in our community on a recent uh, uh, ambulance call. And I want to call... Uh, Chief Nelson and staff and, and to the uh, microphone and, and proceed. Thank you. Good evening. I think you can take that right off of the uh, stand if you'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> we'll fix it if you do. Well, uh, we have the uh, Fitzgerald family with us to tonight. Mark, his wife, Crystal, and their sons, Sam and Joe. <laughs> I got it right, they're, they're twins. Um, and we wanted to rec rec recognize Sam, Sam and Joe for some uh, extraordinary ac actions that they took uh, at, a, at a time when their, when their dad had a, a medical emer emergency. And I'm going to let uh, Ka 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 Captain Ing Ingram kind of fill, fill us in, in on uh, what ha happened. Thank you. Thank you. So in uh, October, uh, there was an ambulance call to the Fitzgerald residence. And... Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald had a medical emergency, and the two two sons, eight years old, uh, got on 911 without hesitating. And while one was on the phone uh, talking to the dispatcher, the other was watching out the window and communicating back and forth, watching for the police and uh, ambulance to show up. Uh, shortly after, about two hours after the call, I got many emails and phone calls uh, about the actions that these two young uh, individuals did and uh, they were all very uh, proud of them. And so I actually went and listened to the tape and uh, couldn't believe that they did an outstanding job, uh, sometimes better than adults do. <laughs> I can, I can uh, vouch for that. So uh, on behalf of the Amherst Fire Department, the Amherst Communications Center, and the Amherst Police Department, we'd like to give you a, a gift of doing an outstanding job. You know, Sam, uh, you guys switch, so I'm yeah. not <laughs> So we all, all, as a community, should be very proud of them. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. to Sam and Joe. Good job. That's a wonderful lesson in public safety and the importance of 911. And uh, the Fitzgerald boys have been taught very well. Thank you. Mr. Musanti, anything else you'd like to add? No, you just hit the nail on the head. And, you know, I was fortunate to attend a recent... A safe graduation, uh, another group of fourth graders in Amherst and the surrounding towns. Uh, Firefighter Ingram and staff are involved with that along with uh, folks in the Amherst schools. And uh, there's, I forget what the number was, but there's been a couple thousand students have gone through that program in the last 17 years. And this is exactly the kind of prevention and, and common sense steps to help our public safety people do their job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well prepared. All right. Um, so now we will move on to public comment. Folks here for public comment, Mr. Keenan, please come forward. Introduce yourself at the mic. Good evening, uh, David Keenan. Thank you for hearing me tonight. I, I wrote a letter, I'm so, I'm so, uh, and I want to just leave this with you. Uh, this is a complicated issue. I'm, I'm certainly not going to be able to do it in a couple of minutes. You only have a few minutes for public commentary. But I welcome being able to talk about this issue however the board sees it most productive. Um, I, I, I would welcome talking either 
with Ms. Mr. Musani or with the board or in a public commentary or something. So I think the, the flavor of the letter is, is pretty concise. Um, and I'd like to leave it with you and hope uh, you get some consideration and talk about this matter. It's, I know it's complicated. I know there's a lot of issues, but I think it's important. Uh, it's something that's left over from my tenancy as select board member. And as you all know, you know, sometimes you get these issues that just don't go away. So uh, I feel as though uh, it's something I have to continue on with. So I'll leave it with the board. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well. All right. Thank you very much. Anyone else here for the public comment section of the meeting? Okay. We got a couple minutes then before our first timed item, so we will go to our untimed items. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about scheduling January through June 2013 select board meeting dates. So you'll recall that I mentioned a couple <coughs> months ago that when it got to be November and we were going to be looking ahead to scheduling our uh, 2013 select board meeting dates that I would suggest, I would throw out there for consideration that we make the dramatic earth-shaking move of going from Monday nights to Tuesday nights. Um, because there are so many Monday holidays, um, that seemed like it would be a, uh, a helpful thing to do, that we would be able to schedule our meetings such that it was always like the first and third or the second and fourth Tuesday of the month instead of having to deal with all the holidays. Um, and so among the benefits to doing that, in addition to the scheduling regularity, was uh, I thought it would be nice to, uh, to the degree that we have to spend a lot of time on Sundays preparing for meetings, I thought that would kind of give us our weekend back. Also, it had some benefits in the office. So then the other day, I was putting together the projected uh, Tuesday dates, and I found that it actually wasn't any easier at all. There are plenty of Tuesday holidays also, <laughs> who knew, but even the, the year starts on New Year's, which is a Tuesday holiday. Um, the, we have various Jewish holidays that happen on Tuesdays. We have elections that happen on Tuesdays. Um, and when I thought more about it, I realized that there are only a couple of months at all that we are looking for a regular schedule. Um, because the fact is we have a bunch of irregular scheduling built into our schedule. We meet as often as necessary during town meeting. We meet every available week in the month before both of the town meetings. And we meet just as little as humanly possible during the summer. So the whole first and third, second and fourth thing basically fell apart. And once I found all of that, I basically changed my recommendation from high to extremely lukewarm. Now I'm not sure it's worth the big shakeup at all, but I have provided in your packets um, calendar pages with uh, both proposed Monday and Tuesday dates. So I wanted to just put all of that information out there for your consideration and see what you'd like to do with it. Ms. Brewer. I know at one point, uh, way, way back in the dark ages, when not everything was televised, um, Certainly one of the things that we would have been concerned about was being on the same <coughs> night as what is typically school committee nights. But it's my understanding that school committee, both at the region and Amherst level, is now able to be televised in their own space as opposed to needing to be in the space as they were at one point. And so aside from the fact that we can't go to their meetings and they can't come to ours, which is something we don't typically do anyway because we meet associated with um, you know, four towns meetings or BCG or JCPC, um, I guess I'm not seeing a problem, but I certainly know that you know at one point that would have made a big difference, but I'm not aware that it's an issue anymore. We did check with other um, folks who use this room, and there was no particular conflict on Tuesday night as far as that went. Ms. Stein. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem with um, uh, Tuesdays uh, during town meeting times, we'd be doing Monday, Wednesday anyway, so we'd be switching back and forth. So if there are no strong reasons <coughs> for doing Tuesdays, I think I just soon stick with Monday. Other thoughts on this side of the desks? Ms. Raiden. Yeah, my thought is entirely personal in that Monday night is the only night I generally have free except for. Okay, there's no strong <laughs> sense of moving towards Tuesday then. Okay, so then uh, 
never mind. Just forget I ever brought that up. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting thought try. exercise. It was worth <laughs> yeah. a try. Yeah. Um, so then there are the Monday nights. Um, so just looking at them as proposed, they are uh, January 7th. Uh, as well as you'll note that January 16th is in there. That's our budget meeting with the town manager. Um, we have been doing that lately on a Friday, but we can do it on a Wednesday this year, the actual date uh, as per the Town Government Act because it falls uh, during the week as opposed to on the weekend. Um, the 29th of, or t 28th rather of January, a uh, couple meetings in February, a couple meetings in March. I don't think there's anything really too dramatic about any of these. Um, I did the best I could considering the schedule and the, the various other things that were going on then. So does anybody have any questions about the dates as proposed now ignoring the Tuesdays, just like with the Blue Mo Monday <coughs> dates? That's good. Okay. So um, maybe if someone would like to make the motion, naming the Monday dates, but I would say um, for May, you could just say as necessary for town meeting during May because I didn't actually double check that we had reserved the auditorium specifically for each of those dates. But okay, I move that the select board approve the schedule for select board meetings January th through June 2013 as presented for Mondays being the primary day. Second. I think that's adequate. Uh, it's been moved and seconded for the discussion. Mr. Aiden. I just point out that there's a lot of second and fourths going on, which I appreciate. Some of them, but even that just wasn't regular. Well, that's, that's not perfect, <laughs> but still, it's, it's very close. All right, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. All right. A couple other minutes here. Um, we might as well do <coughs> some taxi licenses and liquor licenses as we can get through those. We have a revised motion sheet on our desks. Everyone right. should have that with red type. Okay. I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur. No. I move that the select board approve new taxi slash chauffeur licenses for Edward Matthews of East Hampton, Massachusetts, and Enrique Correa de Vega of Amherst on behalf of Zikwi Taxi. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve two new taxi slash chauffeur licenses, one for Joshua Yvonne of Chicopee, Mass, and one for Lawrence O'Connor of Northampton, Mass, on behalf of Aaron's Transportation. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license. No, nope, it's two of them. So <laughs> approve, <laughs> cross out the A, new taxi slash chauffeur licenses for Ellen Dickinson of West Hatfield and Carol Jean Lee of Montague on behalf of Celebrity Cab. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Could you uh, repeat the names for celebrity? Are you one of them? Oh, celebrity. Okay. Um, it's Ellen Dickinson of West Hatfield and Carol Jean Lake, L A I T, of Montague on behalf of Celebrity Cab. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is the owner of Celebrity Cab. He's making okay. sure these are really his drivers. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Those are all set. Then we're good. All right. Yeah, Good right. discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's aye. unanimous. Okay. Do you have time? Or? Uh, now we'll leave the liquor licenses for later. Okay. Okay. So speaking of taxis, our 645 item is taxi business issues. The first bullet on here, the taxi business application for Christian Coach Taxi, uh, that is not ready for our consideration tonight, so we are going to skip over that. Um, and instead, we're going to go to the second bullet, which is approved new taxi regulations effective January 1st. Um, this is something that we have been talking about for a while now. Staff, uh, including town manager, staff from the select board office, and the chief of police have, and the inspections <coughs> folks have been um, meeting first together to talk about what some 
uh, weaknesses were in our regulations, then holding meetings with the different taxi companies to get their feedback on the proposed changes. Um, we have in our packets, and folks can be following along at home with the stuff on the web, um, the proposed new regulations actually revised from what was in our packet. So that was also on your desk tonight. Um, and there's extra red type on the newest version. Um, that is also on the website. Uh, there's also an explanation kind of section by section of what each of the um, changes is about. Um, and there's also a document that it summarizes the feedback received from the uh, taxi companies during this process. So, um, Mr. Musanti, anything else you'd like to say about the about the materials and what, how we got here? Um, I was just going to very quickly uh, go through the handful of changes from the draft regulations that I reviewed with you in some detail at your last meeting uh, that are on your uh, table tonight. Um, so first, in section three, we've added language in the very first paragraph uh, for vehicles. Uh, making clear that to operate, it sounds self-evident, but it's now explicit in the regs, uh, that um, vehicles shall have a taxi registration uh, numbered uh, license plate. And we added language uh, making clear that that does not constitute uh, uh, authority to operate a livery service, and there's a citation of the appropriate mass uh, Registry of Motor Vehicles regulations related to livery service requirements. Uh, that was suggested by a couple of board members and did come up in our discussion with taxi uh, company owners. Uh, secondly, uh, um, on section, later in section three at the top of page three, uh, we did uh, retain language related to the appropriate uh, dress and appearance of taxi drivers, but we made that gender neutral by eliminating the uh, male-centric language from that paragraph. Uh, on section four fares, we just made clear that the requirement for installation of meters uh, is effective January 1, 2013. Um, and uh, again, based upon some discussion with uh, taxi uh, company owners at our feedback meetings. Uh, we did amend the proposed uh, discount for senior citizens to be a minimum of 10%. We originally had a uh, uh, shall be 25% was the first draft. So that was in response to some feedback. Gives taxi companies the discretion to offer a greater discount, but sets a lower minimum uh, threshold. Um, and then on section six violations, um, I think we did some further uh, tightening up of the uh, uh, language about um, um, that the, uh, if a vehicle is in violation of, not the driver, but a vehicle is in violation of the regulations and, or inspection regulations and there are safety issues in the discretion of the chief uh, that vehicle can be removed from service for 30 days. Uh, it's also language in there about a, uh, a second offense uh, happening, you know, if the situation is not remedied, uh, that, that can, uh, there can be a, a, a suspension of the company's license to operate in Amherst for up to 120 days and that um, there's some discretion about the uh, length of that amount and we've built right into that a, uh, that a, a public hearing by the licensing board which is the select board would be scheduled as soon as practicable uh, for due process uh, given that would be a much more severe uh, step we want to um, board needs to weigh in on, on length of that and have an opportunity for the uh, license holder to be heard before that penalty is uh, enforced in full. Um, 
So those were the key changes from last time, and Chief Livingstone is also here tonight, and we're happy to answer any additional questions you may have. Thank you. So just so people recall, this was an effort that um, was undertaken because there was a sense that, first of all, the taxi industry in Amherst had <coughs> grown beyond <coughs> our, uh, our regulatory uh, and enforcement abilities. And um, so th this effort was in order to try and tighten up some weaknesses in our regulations and in order to ensure that um, to, to ensure to the best of, of the town's ability that the licensed taxi services in town are uh, safe for customers. This is all about trying to, to find a way to make sure that um, the, the taxi cab companies are in compliance. Uh, and there were a lot of weaknesses with the under the previous regulations. The key f change in all of this is changing to a metering service. And the reason to change to a metering service is, first of all, it, uh, it makes the fare situation very clear to the passengers, which was one passenger concern. And also, it makes uh, for a much more concerted investment in the taxi vehicle. So that is the vehicle that has the, the meters mounted in it. Uh, it obviously needs to be well maintained as that is the, the, uh, the, the cab with the meter. Um, it makes it um, much more unlikely to be switched out for uh, to, to vehicles that haven't been reported to the town or to have license plate changes or all kinds of strange things were being reported as, as happening out there. <coughs> so this is a way to say, all right, this is this is fairest for the passengers. It's fairest for the companies. It creates a level playing field, and it is easier for all of us to regulate. So that is really the key change. We announced this last year during uh, late fall, right about this time when we were looking at the license renewals for all of our businesses for the following year. We said, get ready, because when we renew licenses at the end of 2012, we're going to be looking at requiring metering of the cabs. All of the cab companies were notified about that change at that time time so they've had 12 months to get ready for that um, so do select board members first of all have any questions or comments about the revised regulations as we have them no okay anyone from the public like to comment on the taxi regulations okay that was easy um, Ms. Brewer. I actually was wondering if during this discussion um, there happened to have been any feedback associated with the, uh, and I know we have a, a section in here about fees and how those can be changed at a public meeting and that, you know, it's not a huge burden to change them. But I wondered if there had been any feedback since I assume it's been some little time now that we've had $25 for an individual and $100 for a business license and if there was any thought as to considering changing those anytime soon since these are going into effect soon and whether or not we feel like those are adequately capturing our costs associated with administering the uh, we have had some discussion at the staff level um, a specific recommendation we haven't included in this package as of now but, uh, uh, it's it's something you know we'll 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 take a look at. I mean, this is a significant change sure. in policies after uh, 18 years, with some upfront costs incurred by the license holders uh, to comply. So that influenced our our thoughts about the fee schedule, at least as at least for now. So at this point, you're it's not likely that you'd be bringing anything forward to us in the next, say, three to six months about a change in fees just associated with the rest of your budget process because of the fact that we're doing um, this at this point? We haven't finished that, but I think it's unlikely. Okay. Uh, but we'll certainly look at it, you know, for future years. Right. But we didn't think 2013 made sense Might given all the, the other right changes time. that are occurring. Sure. Other questions or comments about the taxi <coughs> situation? All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board approve the rules and order regulating the use and operation of taxi businesses in the town of Amherst dated November 5th, 2012 as presented. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. 
Thank you very much. We have Great. new taxi regulations as of January 2013. Fantastic. Great. And uh, thanks to all the companies for being part of the process, for giving their feedback and, uh, and trying to help us improve the, that whole regulatory situation for their and, and everyone's benefit. Okay, we have a couple more minutes before we get to our seven o'clock item. So let's go back to those wine and malt, wine and malt licenses. Okay. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for a reception to be held at UMass Amherst at the Fine Arts Center and it's MOCA, M-O-C-A, on November 14th, 2012 from 5 to 7 p.m. Meredith Schmidt, Campus Center Director. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. And I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for an anniversary celebration to be held at the Eric Carle Museum on November 10th, 2012, from 6 to 9 p.m. Christine Ellison, owner slash manager. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 I'll do the committee appointment since sure. we're right there. I move that the select board confirm the town manager's appointment of Maureen O'Leary, Amherst MA, to the Board of Health for a term to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Okay. Three more minutes. Um, maybe we can be quick with the question about concerning select board meeting schedule for fall town meeting. So we changed the town meeting to uh, seven o'clock, but then we never did talk about when we want our meetings to start. Um, we have been meeting at 6.30. We have 50 minutes. Uh, we had 50 minutes when town meeting was starting at 7.30. Um, we could meet at 6, we could meet at 6.15, split the difference. We could continue to meet at 6.30 and that would give us 20 minutes. What are people's sentiment about that? Ms. Brewer. Well, I'll just jump right in and say I'd rather keep meeting at 6.30, even though I realize it's not giving us a lot of time. I don't want us to have to do a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, we may have to this time around um, associated with the ball town meeting, but going earlier than 6.30 is hard, which does not mean to say I didn't want to try the town meeting at 7, but um, we do have a little more wiggle room if we, of course, don't get quorum anytime near 7 o'clock. But I'm, I just am not sure I'm going likely to be there. And again, I think they should be short meetings anyway, and we already don't have public comment during them, so. Okay, we are set up a little bit strangely this time for needing to take positions at that time. Would we be interested is, in splitting the difference for this first town meeting? Try for 615? We can certainly try. <laughs> we could try. Uh, Mr. Hayden? Clearly, um, some things trump others. Um, and my sense that, um, um, really, we, we've often filled up the hour with work, but if we can't all be there, we definitely have to, to go a little bit later. So I, I don't know if 6.15 works, 6 o'clock works for me, but 6.15, 6.30, I'll talk fast. Talk less. <laughs> talk less. Oh, less? <laughs> um, so does 6.15 seem like a reasonable compromise to start? and? We'll all do our best to be there, and we'll yes. no meeting will start before there are three of us. That's for sure. Okay, <laughs> so six fifteen. So that's good. So I all can right. inform the office and um, uh, ACT uh, Amherst Media, et cetera, about that. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so now it is time to uh, address the warrant articles again. Um, we are voting and assigning select board <coughs> positions on town meeting warrant articles. We have a whole bunch of zoning articles in front of us tonight. Um, and as well as the ones from being put forth by the planning board, as well as the ones being put forth by petitioners um, and one non-zoning petition article. Um, we don't have materials for any of the petition articles in our packets, and I'm not sure if the, those materials aren't available yet or whatever. Um, I know that at the last meeting, the select board didn't feel that they had enough materials to, um, to, to have taken positions on the articles at that time. So um, I hope that you've gotten to read all of those and we can take positions on those after we get through all of these articles. Um, we have, because of the very weird town meeting schedule this time, um, 
it starts very late and the reason it starts late is because of the weird things that are happening this week and next week typically town meeting starts the first monday of november but because tomorrow is the presidential election having town meeting be on both sides of the presidential election was just too much for the town clerk's office and requested we not do that and then next <coughs> week is veterans day because next week is Veterans Day, the select board is also not meeting. So we've got this strange schedule of town meetings starting very late um, on top of these weird um, other constrictions, or not other, because they're related constrictions to the meeting schedule. One of the issues here is that that means that the t planning board is not done with all of its public hearings on all of these articles. So s they are going to be finishing theirs, I believe finishing up on Wednesday night, and that's primarily the petition articles. Um, we don't have another meeting after they do that before we meet at the middle school. So because, as we just discussed, we have a lot less time, even in the old days, to talk about things at the middle school, the only way to proceed with this with this on our end was to have the presentations now with the option to defer a position on them if we so desire. So uh, so that's why we're doing them now in the slightly uh, suboptimal order, but that's the situation. Ms. Brewer. Um, just, to, just to clarify, I mean, in terms of the segue there, I'm a little concerned that the planning board schedule has nothing to do with all of these other things. I mean, in terms of when they were able to form a quorum, be able to come up with their positions, et cetera, et cetera really has nothing to do with whether or not we were ready to meet about these things. So there's not really a relationship. I there. might not have been clear. So um, typically we w have the planning board's recommendation mm -hmm. on things that are related to zoning. So we the, the only reason I referenced the planning board uh, schedule, which I did not reference completely, is that they have hence not taken their positions on the petition articles yet, so they don't have any recommendation to offer us. We can either make our recommendation without that, or if we feel that we want it to go through the uh, planning board public hearing process <coughs> before we've taken our position, then we would defer that. Okay, so I'm not being clear. Why is when the planning board hearings have it already taken place and their positions already been done? That, I guess, is my question because we run into this different years, different times. Obviously, everybody's got stuff going on, but it's not like we don't know we have planning board articles, we don't know we have to have hearings, we don't know we have to do reports. So the fact that we're having town meeting later has basically nothing to do, if anything, planning board should be done sooner in the process. I don't want to speak for planning board, but um, they will be done where they need to be by town meeting. They're just not meshing with our schedule our that schedule. well right. so that's okay. that's not their problem <laughs> that's our problem okay um so anyway that's where we are so we will just go in order and see how this goes um so article 12 is zoning article single family dwellings and we have some folks from planning board planning department here to talk to us about these and um uh so folks know all this information is also on the select board's web packet so welcome please introduce yourself I'm Rob Crowder, I'm representing the planning board. And um, so, so this is the, this is the big show here. This, these, these articles, um, 12, 13, and 14, are addressing um, the problems that, that we've all been experiencing with uh, turnover of, of traditional single family or two family homes to uh, rentals. Um, primarily to unrelated uh, rentals. So, <coughs> so w w there's a, a, a wide range of, of responses and, and, and reactions to, to that situation. This is just one part of it. It's not gonna, it's not gonna solve the problem, um, um, but we hope that, it, that it, it does a little bit, at least. And so these articles <coughs> that 12 addresses single family homes, 13 addresses two-family homes, and 14 addresses converted dwellings. They're meant to be taken together because together they, they present a, a different way of regulating uh, those, these kinds of, of structures. Um, but they, they're divided because they're, they're, they are actually three separate use categories, and they, they can stand alone if necessary. So, the, so um, the, the basic approach is to uh, um, define or, or to divide the use category for single-family homes and for two-family homes into two use categories, 
one of which is owner occupied and would be um, <clears throat> permitted under this under the existing conditions same same way that we do now the other the new use category in both cases would be a non owner occupied <clears throat> and those would be uh, permitted as, as a special permit. You would require a special permit if you, if you wanted to, to use it for that use. And secondly, um, they, these articles are meant to clarify <clears throat> the difference between uh, a duplex and a converted dwelling. So it's very confusing right now. Um, a lot of what is happening is, is you have a, a, a single family home and it is being turned into uh, uh, a structure that that houses two family units or two households um, is that a converted dwelling or is that a duplex what is it um, so we're together these these articles are attempting to define what the difference is and so that we can um, be clear about how we're regulating them <clears throat> so first of all article 12 um, again it's it's uh, taking a single use category and dividing it into two uh, um, the first use category would be uh, owner-occupied single-family dwelling. And by owner-occupied, we mean um, the actual owner lives there or they are renting it to <clears throat> a family um, or other, uh, other, other group of related people. So, it, so it's uh, what we think of as a traditional family-owned and... and um, lived in dwelling. The next use category would be non-owner occupied single family dwelling. And in that case, um, it would be a place where the owner does not live there and they are renting it to up to four unrelated people. So we're, <clears throat> we're proposing that uh, in addition to a, a special permit for that use, that uh, various other conditions are, are required, including um, appropriate management for, this, for the use. Secondly, that, that article would add a, a definition of a single detached dwelling unit where one does not exist right now. Um, I should mention the planning board split evenly on this uh, article, there's, um, we all recognize that it's a very difficult situation. Um, what is the appropriate response? Uh, a number of members of the planning board thought that regulating a single family home in, in such a way that you might have to require, might have to get a special permit in order to rent it to somebody. That's something that we take for granted right now, it's, it's traditional property rights. Some members of the planning board thought that was going too far. Um, other members of the planning board thought that it was important to establish some sort of, of uh, oversight, some sort of review, some sort of permit review for this kind of use. Um, so, and I think, you know, I think there's sympathy um, among all members of the planning board for, for both positions. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of, of what is, you know, what does the town want? So although we split on it, um, we, we did agree that, that it was an issue that a town meeting expects to, to see, expects to make a decision on, and so we, we're, we're bringing it forward so the town meeting can make a uh, decision. What does it want to do? Um, should I go on and, and cover all of them? They are sort of related, or, or we can I stop them. I think that them. makes the most sense. Sure, why don't you do them all, and then okay. we'll go back and ask questions. As um, <coughs> so... Uh, <coughs> Duplex, uh, Article 13, uh, this one does uh, two primary things. One is it, it helps define what a duplex is in the, in the uh, standards and conditions that, that, that accompany the use category. So what a duplex is, is a, a single structure that has the appearance of a single structure, a footprint of, of, a, of a single family home, but it actually contains two dwelling units. And there's language in there that, that describes how, how the permitting body will, will interpret that, that statement. And um, it provides some flexibility for the permitting body to, to vary from uh, a, a strict uh, interpretation of, 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 of that so that it, um, it fits into the neighborhood. It, it, uh, 
um, you know, it's 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 not it's not as, it's not a, a very strict it's, it's not a, a perfectly strict uh, definition, but but it, it the intent is that if you're applying for a permit for duplex, it should look like one house with two with two units. Uh, secondly, um, it would divide the use the current single use category of duplex into two use categories one of which is owner-occupied. Again, that would be regulated the same way it is now. And the second one would be non-owner-occupied duplex, and that would be by a special permit. Um, again, the, the, the non-owner-occupied use would assume that uh, owner does not live in either side of the duplex and that both sides are rented to uh, up to four unrelated people in each one. And uh, again, uh, a definition is added where one does not exist uh, for a two-family detached dwelling unit. Article 14 uh, is converted dwellings. In this case, um, we're not making any changes to the use chart. In all cases, a converted dwelling where it is allowed um, would be by, actually no, um, yeah, in all residential districts, it would it would require a special permit. So, what is a converted dwelling? A converted dwelling, we're saying, is one that um, is substantially the same as as uh, the existing dwelling. It, it can contain up to twenty percent of new um, structure or uh, demolished and reconstructed uh, structure. Um, but we we added a provision that that um, could go up to 40 percent if uh, two or more uh, other criteria are met, including uh, um, handicapped accessibility um, and uh, 40B um, inventory. Uh, other important goals. So so what we're what we're looking for is is uh, a structure that is is substantially the same um, the reason the reason for the converted dwelling uh, category to begin with is is a it's a leftover or it's a um, originated in in post-war zoning where they were uh, trying to protect um, old houses large houses actually what we're faced with in in our historic districts historic neighborhoods um, they wanted to protect them um, in, in, this, in substantially as they were um, existing, but they wanted to be able to allow um, a more dense use of them. So that so that's we're we're trying to extend that, um, um, make it make it uh, uh, clear that a converted dwelling is different from a duplex. A duplex would be uh, have substantially new construction, um, more than twenty percent, or in some cases more than forty percent of new construction. If it's not that, if, if you're just taking a house and, and putting a dividing wall in it or, or adding a little bit more, it's actually a converted dwelling and, and you're going to be regulated as uh, under a special permit in most cases. Um, there's a couple other items um, added to, or changed in the standards and conditions for converted dwellings. Uh, note um, number nine. Um, there's uh, currently there's a confusion about um, in cases of, of a small detached structure. Um, the current language allows uh, conversion of a structure um, of at least 500 square feet with an exterior footprint of at least 500 square feet. It's a little confusing right now what that ex actually means. What we would like it to mean, and what we have decided to change it to mean, is uh, 350 feet of habitable space. Uh, we want the space to be the measurement, the habitable space to be the measurement, rather than the footprint. Um, and we're, we're lowering it um, because uh, um, habitable space typically has a, it would be a smaller measurement than a footprint. Footprint would include uh, uh, steps or a porch or, or so on. Um, 
but we think that 350 square feet is, is a minimum amount uh, necessary for a dwelling. Um, I, th I don't think there's any other major change to the standards and conditions. There's some language change. Um, and, and again, we are um, adding to the definition of converted dwelling um, in, the, in, the, uh, in chapter 12 of the zoning bylaw to make it uh, more clear. Okay, thank you. So uh, the, the agenda erroneously says residential zoning definitions. You guys did that last time, right? That's right. Okay, yeah, I apologize. I meant to take that off. Um, okay, so 12, 13, and 14. Thank you very much for um, the explanation, and thank you to the planning board for putting all this effort into different ways to try and address what is clearly the uh, a critical issue facing all of Amherst neighborhoods right now. Um, so um, to try and organize how we talk about this, um, I'll say that I think that the uh, duplex and converted dwelling ones are uh, pretty straightforward and among the most important things that, that, that those are doing, I think, is clarifying, as is made clear in the, uh, in the planning board reports, which are very good, about the, the permit shopping situation that was going on there, um, because there is some ambiguity <coughs> otherwise as to is something a duplex or a converted dwelling. Um, the duplex article was brought to town meeting and failed a couple of years ago. Can you tell us generally what the difference is between this one and that one? Um. I, there's actually not much difference. Okay. Um, it's it's substantially the same. Um, the, the language about requiring um, appropriate uh, professional appropriate management is added. Um, I, I think the problem last time was that it was it was confusing what the intention was. Um, now that it's in the context of of, of uh, uh, addressing the rental problems that we're having, uh, hopefully it'll be more clear to people. Okay, so. Select board, as I recall, supported the duplex article the last time. <laughs> Do we have any questions about it this time? It was a good idea then. It was a good idea now. Okay, anything in relation to the converted dwellings versus the duplexes, which is um, a, a lot of clarification going on there, really important stuff. Ms. Brewer. I, I just wondered if you could characterize a little bit associated with density, one of the favorite words of the people, as you know, because you were one of them working on the master plan. Um, looking at page three of Article 14's report, <coughs> It talks about how in some districts you would be there. There was a point at which you could convert to six units, but now, and, oh. and I totally appreciate wanting to make it simple by having them all be four. Could you characterize like where that is and why we would want to go ahead and do that to reduce from six to four? Where that is, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, in, I'm sure Mr. Tucker can tell us off the top of his head exactly what areas of town we're talking about, just to give people a sense of oh, uh, what we're RPM. talking about okay. without the without the maps up in front I see. of us. Okay, so so yeah, so uh, yeah, right. That's I should have mentioned that. So one of the th one of the changes in standards and conditions for converted dwellings is that is reducing the number of possible units that can that can result in the RG and RN districts from six to four. That would match the other residential uh, districts, um, which are already four. Or, or, or it's actually RG and RVC, right? Is that what that one is? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so RG and RVC are, are, are the, what we consider the, the, the most dense or the potentially the most dense uh, residential districts. RG is, is the area around the downtown on, on all, all sides. Um, basically going from uh, the Lincoln Avenue area down to um, yeah, d yeah, down to, down to East Village, over to, over to um, the high school area, um, and the RVCs is is are the residential uh, buffer around many of the village centers. Um, I don't know if all of the village centers have RVC zones or how big they are, but but it's it's basically a a. a a second ring of, of the village centers. So, so, so you're right. So normally we would, we would want those to be dense. Um, and in fact, the, the zoning subcommittee um, did not make the recommendation to, to change that from six to four. But the planning board in the public hearing, um, we heard that people want uh, to be as careful as possible. Um, and and not um, allow too much density um, inadvertently, I guess. 
Um, and so, so it's 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 a it's a gesture to to um, people who are concerned about conversions adding too much density too fast. So um, it's a it's a compromise position. Uh, Mr. Tucker and then Mr. Watts. Uh, the uh, for many years um, the density involved with conversions in the various ways that it was expressed in the zoning bylaw from mid-early 20th century up until, I believe, the 1980s, uh, the maximum uh, density as a result of conversion was four units everywhere, anywhere. Uh, and it was only uh, in the late 1980s that in those districts immediately around the mixed-use centers, it went to six units. I, I can tell you just from a, a vague sense of it that we are nowhere near uh, all buildings capable of being converted being up to four units. Uh, and in many, however, in many cases, we have any number of larger older homes that have many more units than uh, four or six, six. or eight or, <laughs> or 10. So it depends on uh, the history uh, of development. But in terms of approaching uh, the question of the, the rapid spate, uh, spate of conversions that we have been seeing, I think that was part of the reason for determining that we needed to slow this down and actually take a look at uh, these different uh, zoning districts. For instance, and we, you've probably heard me say this before, the general residence district that Mr. Crowner described includes nine, 10, 12 different districts which developed at different points in history, have completely different characters, densities, spatial arrangements, and so forth. And the notion of there being any one requirement, dimensional or density or whatever, for all of those districts is um, a tad silly. So what we need to do over time uh, in the future years is to analyze all of those districts and propose zoning that is specific to them rather than having a, a blanket requirement. In this case, we are responding to a near-term, I suppose you could call it emergency uh, of a kind. Um, I expect it will change again in the future uh, and be based more closely on what's actually there. Okay, so at this point, the, the recommendation is to go to four as the maximum for conversions. Mr. Walt. That answered my question, thank you. All right, other <coughs> questions or comments from Select Board um, about the duplex or the converted dwellings part? Okay, so then there's the single family dwellings. This one is more complicated. This is a much more dramatic change um, for the community. Um, select board, Mr. Wald. First of all, again, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to commend Mr. Crowner for his typically precise and sober explanation and the attempt to be fair and show both sides of this. Uh, and I, I know it's a very difficult issue. We all feel really sh very strongly about it because of the social consequences. And in addition, uh, it's tempting to reach for the first tool at hand, which isn't always the right tool. So I have mixed feelings myself about the attempt to use zoning. Uh, I noted in passing we failed, the town meeting failed to pass the development modification bylaw, which would have addressed some of these problems. Uh, I've got a rental of this type across from the st street from me. And it's, if anything, as well or better run now as a rental with four people in it. So it's, it's a mixed case. But just briefly then, could you characterize the alternative steps? Because the one position says it could be done by measure other than zoning. Could you outline just briefly what steps those might be, how complicated and so forth? All right. So yeah, so, so actually po possibly a better way of, of handling uh, a single family home um, rented to <coughs> four unrelated people is, is by a strong rental permitting system. Mm -hmm. And so I anticipate that, that, that um, when the town um, does develop that system and bring it forward that, that um, it, it may, be, may be that zoning is, is not, uh, zoning that strictly is not necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. However, um, we don't have that yet. Um, we hope that we'll get it in six months, but who knows what will happen mm -hmm. in town meeting. Um, so w what is currently the case is that a home that is lived in by its owner right next door to you could turn over to a rental property with four or however many people right. living in it without anyone knowing at all. Right. Um, so 
so this is an attempt to um, make sure that somebody is, is, is providing some oversight on that, putting some conditions on it, whatever. So um, whether this is the right tool in the long run, I don't know. Um, but it's 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 um it's a, a tool that that we're proposing as as a as a, at least an interim step. But the the, the key other alternative would be the uh, rental permitting, and within half a year it could be in place. Is that a could fair be, yeah. statement? Could um, be okay. yeah. An, another you know potential alternative would be a different permitting standard, um, site plan review or something. But Thank that's you. not what was being proposed. Other questions or comments, Ms. Brewer? Since this opportunity when you're before the select board is obviously yet another audience, just like with your planning board hearings, perhaps <coughs> you could um, characterize how it is that when, when something that, that this directly affects people in, in a way that perhaps people don't think of because of, they think of other things as affecting the investors themselves, whereas if someone didn't follow the rules here and we had this zoning in place, what would happen? what would the enforcement look like? It's not the same as when we have a rental registration bylaw and very, that will all lay out what can happen if things aren't done appropriately. In a situation like this, if someone just goes ahead and converts the house, it, this goes into place, we go ahead and say, oh yeah, this is a great idea, and then someone does convert the house next to me without going through the steps, then what happens to the people who are living there and to the property owner? How does that process mm -hmm. work briefly without you know hours of time here? But um, well. Um, as is the case now, um, if, if there is a, a zoning violation, um, the zoning enforcement officer will, will take whatever steps he thinks is, is appropriate, including fines. Um, but he's not going around to every house all the time. He's going to respond to a complaint or, or, um, or a, a, a police call or, or something. So there's going to be a reason for, for um, taking a look at, at the house and... and, and and trying to determine what what is going on, and so what what would happen in the case that you talk about is it becomes a zoning violation, it becomes um, a, a, a finable offense. Um, so I, I don't I don't know ex I don't know what would happen to the people who live there. Um, and and maybe that's not so <laughs> speaking. I don't know. Please. I don't know how all those details then play out. And you know, just we had the situation with the one house that kind of became the example of the four unrelated persons. The person moved out before we could really see what might have happened under those circumstances. So uh, perhaps the town manager would be, would be better able to address that. I mean, obviously we'd call, we'd say, there's a problem here. They would, he would go there, he would say, yep, yep, there's a problem here. These people didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, but of course, that's not really the tenant's fault, so to speak. So then what happens? Mr. Meese, to your Mr. Tucker. Yeah, I'd ask Mr. Tucker to right. walk through that in more detail. Uh, you can. Um, there is a process for enforcement laid out in the zoning bylaw itself, uh, section 11.4, page 102, for those of you who have the current uh, version. Those of you with old versions are on your own. Um, but the process is laid out in, in detail uh, that the building commissioner as the zoning enforcement officer must follow in terms of notifying the person that they're in violation and the actions that follow on that. Within that framework, they have a great deal of, of discretion and need it. Uh, we don't necessarily always want to go right to whacking somebody with with fines because uh, you can then result with uh, that, that can result in challenges, appeals to the zoning board of appeals, uh, court action, and all of that can take a great deal longer to resolve than the building commissioner saying, "If you don't do this, I might have to do the following." Um, but in any case, it's laid out. Uh, process is laid out here. There is an appeal process if the person disagrees with the order that's been given, and that goes to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, if that appeal process doesn't work, it goes to the courts. The we we do have the ability to impose a non-criminal uh, disposition ticketing as well. They, they just get a ticket, and then the issue becomes, uh, are they going to pay it, and how are we right. going to force them but to pay it, and so forth. Done. Mr. Hayden. Um, I want to sort of explore just a slightly different avenue. I understand the, 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 the ideas and the, and the intent of the rule, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering, though, um, as I understand it, um, 
the, the, there are a number of other rules, which are not zoning rules, regarding um, uh, tenants and um, people allowing to, to, to have tenancy. Um, the question I have is that it, it let's, let's imagine that um, for um, upstanding uh, teachers have found a place finally where they can live near where they work and it's because somebody has chosen to surreptitiously change their home from a class one to a class two dwelling and they, they sign a legitimate lease, it's a contract, and now uh, Robert shows up and says, I'm sorry, you've got to leave because um, it's not allowed by zoning. How does housing court deal with that? Mr. Tucker. I can't speak for housing court, um, but what I can say is that in that inst the instance you cite, there, there would be, in the first case, uh, it would have been unlikely that there would have been a complaint and it would have come to our attention. There are all kinds of scoff law behaviors going on every day in Amherst that nobody ever knows about because everybody behaves so well that it, it's not an issue. The purpose of the law, nine times out of ten, is to deal with the problems that, that come about, not with sort of standard, normal human behavior. Um, the issue, in, I think, in, in that case <coughs> would be between the tenants and their landlord. It was the landlord who broke the law uh, by uh, creating a, a, uh, an underground rental, so to speak, and their, their issue would be with them and not with, and f in fact, the enforcement officer's issue would be with the, the property owner and the landlord and not with the tenants. Uh, there would be the problem that if we got as far as a cease and desist order saying that this use must stop, then they have to find other places to live. That is part of what the concern was on the part of uh, some of the planning board members who, who said, let's wait until we have a rental regulation system in place, that you they didn't want to get into a situation where housing had been created um, illegally and in the middle of a semester, for instance, whether it's, te whether it's teachers or students or whomever, um, administrators, um, suddenly lose their housing because no, no, people forgot to follow or didn't, weren't aware of the rules. Um, with a rental regulation system, uh, you won't be able to escape awareness of it, <laughs> is the intent. Um, Ms. Stein, did you have a question about this? No? Okay. Uh, Mr. Pratt. Also. <coughs> also, also, presumably one of the, um, one of the uh, results or the effects of, of the building commissioner discovering a, a zoning violation is that he would require the owner to apply for a special permit. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so uh, I, th I appreciate all of the intent behind this article and um, the, the town is trying very hard in a number of different ways to address this ongoing and, and very real problem. Um, to me, uh, this article feels like kind of the step of last resort. And considering how much effort we're putting into, for example, the rental regulation situation and, and how near term that is now, um, I feel like it's much too soon to do the step of last resort. I think that we should see how the rental regulation uh, situation plays out first and then um, and then if that didn't work you'd maybe go to a step like this personally I, I am concerned that this is this is something that affects every single one of us who is a property owner in Amherst this is not just your neighbor and what they might do to your house this is what would happen to you as you're trying to sell your house if you have taken an entire section of the the, the marketplace who might want to buy your house and that sale is now going to be contingent on whether or not they can get a special permit to rent your no longer your house out when they buy it. That that strikes me as just an incredibly radical change. It's one that I can understand the community sort of thinking about and saying, yes, there are pros and cons to that, but our problem is so bad we think that that's the the right way to go. But um, but I think that it's premature to be considering a, de a, a, a decision like that when we haven't gone the rental permitting route yet. So um, so I'm not going to be able to support this article. Ms. Stein. I hate to be in opposition, but I am going to support this because I <coughs> think we have seen such erosion of the housing stock 
um, being converted with no regulation. And it takes a while to get the perfect, and I wouldn't want this to um, be pushed aside while we wait for the perfect. I, I think, I'm guessing that one of the things that will come with the rental um, regulations is that all the properties will be registered and that sort of thing, but this seems to me like a, a perfectly reasonable piece of zoning on its own, um, and so I, I would be happy to support it because when I look at the data that are supplied, I think the rapid increase um, in uh, conversions and so on has been extraordinary. And there have been so many complaints as a result that I'd like to have a stopgap measure while we work for the perfect, so. Other thoughts on Article 12? Mr. Aiden and Mr. Wall. As I was um, going over this, um, I felt a little bit, and, 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 and I think you, you phrased it very well, but I felt, felt a little bit like the cart was getting before the horse. Um, it would be interesting, I think valuable, um, for um, uh, this article to have ref referenced and sort of taken as its legal underpinning, let us say, the, the further rules and regulations about registration and everything else. And that's just not here. It can't be. Um, and uh, it would be useful and I think um, would actually um, uh, make the, 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 the zoning more robust um, um, and more enforceable, more just a, a better, stronger piece of zoning um, that could be enforced, that could be understood by even somebody as displaced as a housing court. Uh, for example, so. In a similar vein, just sort of thinking out loud as we go along here, and, and again, I appreciate the concern that I'll bring to the issue and the subtlety with which you're approaching it. Um, I realize that these three articles also fit together pretty well. What, but speaking in terms of urgency and so forth, what would be the harm in postponing Article 12 until spring town meeting or at such time as after the regulations are in place. I mean, what is the urgency that makes one want to bring this forward now as opposed to waiting, as Ms. O'Keefe said? Um, the, the fact that, that houses are being bought up and, and turned into rentals of students. So actually, let me, let me um, um, there's one thing that I didn't say, and that's um, there's a preamble to Articles 12, 13, and 14. This was um, language that suge was suggested by town council. And what it, what it does is, is it um, establishes um, or it, or it uh, asserts that, in fact, um, there's a difference between a, a home that is lived in by an owner and, and a home that is lived in by uh, or that is rented to unrelated people. And so it's, it's establishing a difference, and, and therefore um, it makes sense to, to regulate them differently. And so that's, that's what the point of that is. Um, and, and so if you think of it, if you think of it as your home, and, and I can do whatever I want with my home, that's, that I understand how you would take uh, one position. If you think of it as this is one use and this is another use, you might, you might be willing to regulate them differently. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. Um, two things. One is, I'm, I'm assuming we're, it's accepted that this would not prevent uh, parents from purchasing a house for their student, and they then have other students there. It, it, I'm not entirely clear that you're going to be able to show that it's not, that that's not a class one single family dwelling. If the actual, you know, 19 year old has the house in their name, which we know there are cases of. Then and they lived there with their four buddies from the lacrosse team. It's a little unclear to me how that fits in, although I know that isn't the main category of use that people are concerned about. They're more concerned about companies from out of town coming in and switching things over. Mr. Tucker. The current existing definition of owner-occupant in the zoning bylaw um, talks about 
uh, one or more natural persons who in their individual capacity is distinct from any representative capacity own a whole or undivided interest in fee simple of a certain real property, and at least one of whom occupies the dwelling unit as their principal residence. So it has to be, they have to own a, a whole and undivided interest in the property. It's not, they're sort of named or they have 2% or whatever it is, and it's not mommy and daddy own it and they're letting their child or their adult child live there. Uh, it has to be someone who owns the property living there and it has to be their principal residence, which uh, you may recall from looking at Article 15, we've made a whole set of definitions about uh, what constitutes principal residence uh, and have left it up to the zoning enforcement officer and or the permitting board to determine that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's not, it's possible, the scenario you describe is possible, it's, it's not, wouldn't be easy. It's unlikely to begin with, it becomes more difficult under these regulations. Because of 15? Yes. Um, Ms. Stein and then Ms. Brooks. Sure. Well, I was just going to say that the difference is a difference in permitting between class one and class two. It's just that the, this for class two, it would be a little bit more rigorous permitting because it would be a special permit. <coughs> it's not precluding um, use by uh, up to um, for unrelated individuals. It's just taking a much, a little more stringent look at it. So I I don't see this as being um, particularly arduous for an owner. Um, Ms. Brewer and then Mr. Heaton. Sorry, my other question was in regards to um, the waiting and what happens if we wait. <coughs> the um, new rental registration regulations. I wonder if if someone could. Um, speak with some authority as to if everything comes together the way we would like in terms of developing those because I know we have a lot of people working on that right now and they go forward before spring town meeting when would they actually take effect in terms of the term coming school year and you know how how would the timing work out because I'm sure that's a concern that people have so what's our thought as to how that's currently going to play out Mr. Tucker in terms of the effectiveness of a zoning uh, regulation, the, it is effective <laughs> two times. It's effective as of the date of the first publication of the legal ad for the public hearing, and it's effective as of the date of the vote. It doesn't become real until the date of the vote, and then it's confirmed later on by the Attorney General's passage of uh, uh, approval of, of the uh, zoning amendment. General bylaw, it's the same thing, except there's nothing about um, the legal ads or anything, it's on the date of the vote in terms of when it becomes effective uh, and then it is blessed by the Attorney General later on. In terms of people's ability to actually enforce it, where we are creating, what we're proposing to do in the spring, as I understand it, is to create a set of rental regulations, to create an accompanying structure of people to enforce those regulations and that all becomes real on July 1st when uh, the budget and everything else associated with that goes into effect and then you have to hire people and, and so forth. So we're probably talking about uh, early fall, fall of uh, 2013 for when this actually starts to be enforced. The issue, um, going back to the question of the zoning and exposure, um, remember that under zoning when you change the zoning regulations, the previously legally existing uses are grandfathered and you can't make them not go away and you can't make them come in and get a permit unless they're changing something you know, in a significant way such that the use itself is, is being changed. So any new conversions that happen between this fall town meeting and the spring town meeting would, would be, become automatically grandfathered if, even if we brought um, Article 12 to the spring town meeting. Um, and the longer that goes, the more of them become legally grandfathered. So that's that's the exposure I think that's being discussed. Uh, where was I with select board? Did somebody uh, uh, else? A say? question and a comment. Um, from the way this is set up, um, the question I would have is how common is this type of zoning 
in the state. My suspicion is that um, this is pioneering, um, and in, in which case, um, you know, I think we need to understand that there will be some testing. It's likely there'll be some testing of it. So that, that's, that's the question, and, and I missed a line in there that said it's the first. So the, the comment that I would make is that um, um, I'm not clear that we have enough staff to look after all of this in place right now when it comes time to enforce and, and make all of this go. Mr. Musanti? Yeah, and you know, the how it's enforced and by who is an ongoing discussion and the scope and breadth of uh, the inspection component in particular will largely impact what the recommended staffing levels are. And part of this work group that I've been talking about will look at structures to bring that about and how they're paid for and by who. Okay. So select board, d d are we looking for additional information before we make our recommendation on this? Or are we ready to make a recommendation? Ms. Stein. I just would like to add one other thing. I, I think the people at home may not be aware, but from 2009 to 2010, um, they went from eight uh, owner-occupied to non-owner-occupied, a change of two. From 2010 to 2011, there was a change of three additional, and now we're up to seven additional over 13. So it's really going up almost exponentially, and uh, that's why I feel the urgency of getting something into place and not waiting. I guess I have some concern that we've been in a particularly challenging real estate market over the last couple of years since the economic crash, um, et cetera. And I'm concerned about drawing conclusions, making regulation zoning changes that are based on such a peculiar real estate market at this moment when this is going to have major repercussions. The, the real estate market is going to do all kinds of different things in relation to the student population at UMass, et cetera, over the years. And the idea of, of putting such an anchor on a potential home sale, I, if you're needing to leave the area because, you know, your, your partner got a job in some other part of the country or, um, you know, you're, you're moving to uh, a different kind of living situation or whatever, the idea that you would p have uh, a potential, the, the, the idea of turning your house into a rental was going to hinge on a uh, special permit which can be refused just seems like an additional um, real complication that is applying to everyone. I think it's, a, I think it's, a, it, it's using a, a hammer when you want really something much more surgical than that. I could have made a good analogy there, but I, the words didn't come to me quick enough. But anyway, uh, it's, a, it's about using a, a, a much bigger tool than, um, than is appropriate to get at the specific problem. And considering the rental regulation situation that we're, um, we're actively working to have for spring, it just, it's just the wrong combination of factors for me. Ms. Brewer. And, and I'm sorry I've asked to speak so many times. I'm just, which I'm not usually sorry about, but I, um, <laughs> I'm really torn on this particular issue because I, I very much normally consider myself to be a fairly large property rights person. And if I do need to sell my house, then I would like the option of, you know, if I can't get a decent price, that if I have to send it, sell it to an investor, well, you know, that's life. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> there's a lot obviously going on here. And one of the... It, if we're trying to send a signal, this is one heck of a really clear signal to outside investors that's right now, that's fairly immediate in terms of if we, f if we do this in the fall, and then obviously the Attorney General takes their little time to do it, but it would, because things are so cyclical here associated with the student rentals, I think it would now is a time to really make a dent in choices that, of investments people would make over the next six to eight months. So it's, um, it, I'm not quite sure I'm ready to decide to vote, but um, on my position right now, or maybe I'll change it later. But normally I'm not big on a hammer when maybe we need a finer tuning thing, but I think what people are desperately looking for right now is that hammer, and I'm not sure that this is so bad. 
when it comes right down to it. So, Mr. Wald? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm sympathetic and torn. <coughs> uh, I really understand the motive behind this, and I'm tempted to vote for it, but I also think about my neighbors across the street who needed to rent their house, and it suited their needs, and it's been good for the neighborhood, so I don't want to be precipitous. I guess my feeling is that, you know, all things being equal, when we are this divided about something, we might be better and come up with a stronger position if we had more time to think about it and hear more evidence for our next meeting. Okay. So our next meeting, we've already decided, is going to be about <laughs> 35 meeting. minutes long, but right. sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, the, it's the information in between, not so much the deliberation. Yeah, for sure. Mr. Hayden. And, and one, one thing that, <coughs> that I'm going to try to get a handle on is the effect that this will have on the property values, uh, especially in, in some neighborhoods. I mean, this, this, this might, I could see how it might, and I may discover that I'm totally off base, sort of decrease the value to a point where um, our 90 percent of our tax base might be smaller. <coughs> um, I mean, really, the, 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 what's going on is that there's a, there's a market tension between people who want to move into neighborhoods and people who just want a place to put students because it's a valuable thing to do. And the balance is tipping, as you suggest, because of uh, a rather unique situation that we're in. Um, and decreasing the value of those houses to a point where anybody could live in it with, us, with their family would work. Interesting. Okay, Ms. Brewer. Can I suggest that we um, not take a position on 12, but we could go ahead and take our positions on 13 and 14? Sure. Okay. Are folks good with that? Yes. Okay. Then, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion on 13? Sure. I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 13, zoning bylaw, two family dwellings. Second. For the discussion. That's simple enough, okay. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 14, zoning bylaw, converted dwellings. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. All right, we're skipping 15, so now we're at the petition article. So if I know you guys haven't um, considered these yet, but uh, to the degree that you want to stick around and comment on how they may or may not mesh with the other things that you guys are doing and we'll be considering, that could be great. Mr. Tucker. I would just note very quickly that the planning board did have a hearing on Article 18 and oh, make okay. a recommendation on that. Thank you. It's um, 16, 17, and 19 that they... Gotcha. Okay, Mr. Hayden. I just wanted to... Uh, uh, mentioned to our friends who may watch television only on Monday night that there's been a ton of work going on on Wednesday nights um, in the planning board around these articles for which I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Okay, so we have then the petitioners who are looking to speak to these for, uh, we'll start with Article 16. And anybody who's tuning in late, I erroneously put Article 15 on this list today This uh, that was dealt with at the last meeting. So Article 16, Ms. Adams. And just to clarify, we do not have paperwork on 16 and 17, right? We're about to. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, but not from the planning board because they haven't had their hearing yet. Right. At least there's some background material that may be helpful. Thank you. Can also be amended. Thank you. Okay. And if you could both introduce yourself for folks at home. Yes, uh, good evening. My name is Maurianne Adams, and uh, I'm from Precinct 10. And um, I suppose the theme for the evening is that the perfect is the enemy of the good, because I think that theme may come up again with our petition articles. And I'd like to say that although my name is quite visible on all of these articles, and I'm pleased to see it there, uh, that uh, I was the person who turned in the paperwork, and I'm working with a group, uh, a coalition of Amherst neighborhoods uh, that has become quite active in uh, the recent few years as we've become coalesced and become 
concerned about exactly the urgency of conversions, of um, uh, overcrowded rentals, of nuisance houses becoming an anchor or a, a magnet for very large parties for students who are looking for a place to drink as well as uh, under uh, uh, basement bars. So there are a number of things that uh, because of enforcement difficulties or one issue or another we felt uh, were urgent and that they urgently affected not only our neighborhood by Precinct 10 I mean of course the neighborhood between the campus and town but it's clear that this is now an issue that has extended across town. I believe there may be only one neighborhood at the moment that is exempt from this uh, difficulty. So I just want to give a bit of overview and then I'm going to turn the microphone over to various members who will speak to various uh, specific petition articles. But let me just say uh, as an overview uh, that our concern with these, uh, with these articles, and there are three zoning articles and one town bylaw, the nuisance house bylaw article. So three of them are zoning, one of them is a town bylaw. And our goal is to stabilize and restore sustainable family-oriented neighborhoods characterized by a mix of residents where families with elders, children, working adults, and students can live in harmony. It's very important to know that we not be construed as anti-student. Many of us have worked our entire professional lives at the university or in community colleges or in other educational venues. We value the students who live in our neighborhoods. We're concerned about the tilting of the neighborhoods so that they are no longer hospitable or affordable by families with small children. And we're trying to maintain a balance in the neighborhood and avoid the kind of student ghettos that we have seen in other college towns when both town and gown have not paid attention to the urgency of these problems. These three, the three zoning articles work to reconcile two seemingly opposed concepts in the master plan itself. On the one hand, increased density within Amherst central residential neighborhoods, and on the other hand, preserving the integrity and character of these residential neighborhoods. That's really the problem that we're trying and asking you to help us address. So the zoning articles that we are proposing are designed to allow increased density, but without sacrificing the attractive qualities of these neighborhoods. <coughs> and uh, we'll speak about the specific issues of each of these articles separately. Um, uh, Denise Barbaret will say something about Article 16. You'll notice, I apologize, since I hadn't realized you didn't have materials, I simply pulled out of the computer something that I had handy, and they're not in the exact order of 16, 17, 18, and 19. So if you want to put little article numbers next to them, you'll find, and now I'm speaking to the select board, not to the television audience, you'll find them uh, going as 17, 16, 18, and 19, okay? And so Denise Barbaret will say a word about 16. I'll come back to the microphone for 17. Then so Connor will say something about 18. And Melissa Perot and John Fox will say something about 19. Let me also add that there are about eight of us from the coalition in the room. And we would be pleased if the select board had questions that various of us might take an opportunity briefly to make comments so that no one person of us unduly represents a coalition that is trying uh, to work together. I also want to note, uh, before I give up the mic to uh, Denise Barbaret, uh, that we have been regular attendees on those Wednesday night meetings. We have not been as busy as the Zoning Subcommittee and Committee and Planning Board, but we've been pretty busy working with them. We've sought their help. Uh, we've worked with the Planning Department. Uh, we still have a way to go. We really are some of us amateurs with this, but we decided that we needed to move quickly and learn as we went. Uh, so that you will see that, set, that um, Article 16 maps in some ways onto 13, and we're thinking about and working with the Zoning Subcommittee and the Planning Board to figure out the coord exact coordination of these. You realize, of course, we had to get these in on September 19th. I believe that was our due date, and that was the date before the Zoning Subcommittee or the Planning Board had fully developed all of the articles that we are in some ways matching. Similarly, uh, our Article 17 will be mapping onto 14, whereas 18 and 19 are standalone articles. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I'm Denise Barbarette, North Whitney Street, uh, town meeting member from Precinct 9, and I'm going to be talking about Article 16, which is a two-family dwelling, and I guess I see it as an alternate article to Article 13. So what Article 16 proposes is actually very simple and very straightforward. It states that if you start out with a single-family home and you renovate, expand, or put an addition onto it so that the end result is a two-family home, also known as a duplex, you must do so under a special permit before the Zoning Board of Appeals rather than by site plan review under the Planning Board right now. Article 16 further takes advantage of already extant and applicable language in the zoning bylaw by treating such renovations, expansions, or additions either as conversions, which is section 3.3241 in the zoning bylaw, or as supplemental apartments, which are accessory uses, and those are now governed under section 5.011 in the zoning bylaw, in case the audience members would like to follow along. The Coalition of Amherst Neighborhoods has proposed this amendment to the zoning bylaw because of growing concern over the unintended consequences of another amendment that came from the fall meeting, actually the fall special town meeting of 2008. At that time, the permitting of duplexes in RG, which is general residence neighborhoods, and also RBC, which is village center residences, changed from special permit to site plan review. The special permit would have been under the Zoning Board of Appeals and site plan review then fell under the purview of the Planning Board. This was one of the first zoning changes that we saw as a result from the master plan and basically what it aimed to do was to increase density in the central neighborhoods in town in a modest way by, accounting, by accommodating two families in essentially what was a structure that looked like a one family and provided a footprint of a one family home. By accommodating more families in our central residential districts, it would enhance and it would also protect our traditional family neighborhoods. To the dismay of many residents, this has not been the actual result. What we've begun to see are single family homes that have been purchased and either renovated and divided to accommodate not four, but now eight individuals, usually students, um, and one example would be 156 Sunset Avenue, which actually did go before the ZBA uh, special permit because it was a non-conforming property. Or we are also seeing large two-story structures that are being added to existing single-family homes. An example of this is 79 Taylor Street, which I believe went before the planning board in 2001, probably sometime in the spring of 2001. Um, both of these properties are now used as student rentals, as far as I know. I do not know whether or not they have been disruptive to their neighborhoods, though I do know there was at least one police report of 79 Taylor's, uh, one, one police response uh, that I read about in the police report to 79 Taylor Street. Um, but I don't know if there have been other reports on either of these properties. I'm just using them as examples, and they shouldn't necessarily be seen as negative examples. Um, but I do know that what this use of property brings are increased number of cars, more traffic, and more activity at more hours of both the day and the night than one would see from more traditional families, which one can construe as individuals or couples with or without children. This is why the Coalition of Amherst Neighborhoods would like to see the permitting of such two-family homes return to the special permit process so that it can be the Zoning Board of Appeals that will decide whether or not such a, such a use is appropriate in either the General Residence District or the Village Center Residence District. Rather than leaving open at least what I see personally as a very large loophole, first allowing an owner-occupied duplex under site plan review, and then should that owner decide, well, I'm tired of doing this, let's sell it, or circumstances might happen where the owner has to move and can no longer be the be use that as his principal residence and then has to rent it out. It seems to me that this is a very easy way to bypass the special permit process. So rather than have that process bypassed, we would like to see the ZBA decide even before the duplex is created whether or not this is actually an appropriate use in this particular neighborhood. What it will do 
is it will give greater protection to the neighborhood and it will also bring duplexes more in line with the permitting requirements for, vote for both the conversion of dwellings and also the addition of supplemental apartments. Neither of these has, a, has as great an impact as a duplex would in terms of the amount of space that it occupies, the visual impact, and in general in the number of individuals that can it accommodate. Um, supplemental apartments we tend to think of as mother-in-law apartments. Um, I don't think there are a lot of mother-in-laws or perhaps father-in-laws who invite the same amount of police response as we have seen in some of these converted duplexes, and yet they are still required to go through the special permit process. So by when you add essentially space that is going to accommodate more residents and more activity in an area, it seems like it makes more sense to put all this under the permitting process of the Special Permit and the Zoning Board of Appeals. And we hope that this is going to be an easy, a simple, a fair, and a straightforward way to help maintain the integrity and the quality of life in our residential neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay. Questions or comments from Select Board? So I think we're working under the assumption that we're going to not take positions on these and get the kind of digestion by the planning board on them to, um, to, to give their full attention to how well these mesh or don't mesh conflict or whatever with um, or, or overlap with the things that are already <coughs> proposed. So, okay, so, so not related to the planning board part of it. Um, are there questions about the specifics of this as presented? Ms. Barbara, um, knowing what you know now, what you folks all know from the uh, article that was put forth by the planning board, are you seeing any conflict here? You're saying, you, s you said that this is an alternative to that one. Are you saying you wouldn't support the uh, Article 13 because it conflicts with this one? Why? I don't think it necessarily conflicts, but I think it's a lot more, it's a lot simpler, it's a lot more straightforward, and I do have difficulties with dividing things into class one and class two. I think it's it's a very fluid movement between when something be <coughs> when something ceases to become owner occupied and when it goes to a rental property. And I also think, as you pointed out, that there are going to be problems when people want to sell their properties. You may have a duplex that's owner occupied, but you have to move for whatever reason. You want to sell it. The only person who is available to purchase it is somebody who is going to use it as a rental property. And the big question that I have that has not been answered yet, um, although I'm not sure I've actually asked the question, is what happens when someone goes to purchase that property? Before the purchase and sales agreement is signed, will the individual have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and say, hey, here's a duplex, I would like to buy it, but I need to get a special permit, and I'm gonna use it for a student rental. And what happens if the ZBA looks at the person's record as a property owner, and says, no, we don't think this is gonna work, we're not gonna give you the special permit. Or what if any, any individual realizes, oh, now I have to go to before the Zoning Board of Appeals, I've heard it's a really onerous process, all right, I'm, I'm just gonna skip this, I'm not gonna buy this property. So I have serious questions about what this is going to do to people's ability to actually purchase property and to benefit from the purchase of said property. I'm sorry, are you saying you think that the article you're proposing is gonna make that too complicated? No, that's what the planning board article does. By dividing things into class one, where you only need site plan review, and class two, where you need special permit. Ours says from the outset, we want to determine whether or not a two-family is appropriate in this particular area, and therefore it doesn't matter if it's owner occupied. Th this is when it is a renovation, an expansion, or an addition. If you are taking a single family and you are making it into a two-family, as opposed to building an entirely new duplex, we want to we want the ZBA to weigh in on whether or not this is actually an appropriate use in a particular neighborhood. So it gets rid of the distinction between owner occupied and rental property. It just says if it's a duplex that is created by changing a single family home into a two family, we want the ZBA to weigh in on it. We don't want to say if A then this will go this way. If B, then this will go the other way. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments from Select Board, Mr. Wall? That was very helpful, actually. Could you explain a little more about appropriateness? Because obviously, you could have a, a owner-occupied house with six or eight people and a duplex with two, mm -hmm. and physically the buildings could look the same. So how would how would that be determined? Do you think? 
how do you how do you I'm see appropriateness being calculable in these cases? Appropriateness of the use? Yeah. Again, given the fact you could have fewer people in two duplexes than a single large family house. Well, basically what we're talking about are student rentals. I think that that's the very large elephant in the room. And since many, since what we're seeing at this point is basically single family homes being bought and renovated or expanded to be used for student rentals, that's really what we're looking at. If somebody's going to be quiet, that's great. We have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to be loud and invite the police to come. But we do know that often with student rentals, we do have that type of problem. We do have that disruption to the neighborhood. Um, some property managers, managers are better than others. Um, what we really want to <coughs> do is not have this be a problem to begin with. Mm -hmm. So if the people living there, if it's six to eight people and they're perfectly quiet, I don't think anybody has an issue with that. I don't think there no. would be any issues if that's the way people were. But we can't regulate who rents the building. No, we can't. So that's why the ZBA needs to look and say, okay, what's the character of the neighborhood? This is what is proposed. It's going to be a rental property. It could accommodate up to eight tenants. Is this appropriate for this particular neighborhood? It will be the ZBA who has the final say on that. And that, that's also why the property owner's reputation or business profile comes into it. I'm assuming that that's what the ZBA can take into account, but I don't know. Never having been on the ZBA, I can't speak to that. Okay. Other questions or comments from Selectman? Okay, so bearing in mind that between now and our next meeting, we'll get a planning board report about this and some kind of opinion. So if you have any other questions that you need to be answered, we're not going to be deliberating hugely about this is our expectation at the next meeting. We're going to be more or less maybe summarizing our new <coughs> information and then voting. So, okay, no more questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Next is uh, s Article 17. Morianne Adams, Precinct 10. Uh, let me also add that if there are uh, questions that, you, that come after my presentation that others may be more qualified to address, uh, I'd be glad to uh, turn the mic over to them. So I'm speaking about uh, Article 17, and I want to, and this is the first one that is noted on the uh, pages that I handed out to you. Uh, this revised language aims to allow for modest increases in density without sacrificing the life for all residents. Uh, this article mandates that for any properties to be converted uh, into two or more dwelling units, one of the units shall be and shall remain owner-occupied. This provides the stability associated with owner-occupied properties, oversight of tenant behavior by the property owner, him or herself, and in the event of disruptive behavior by tenants, assures that neighbors know whom they should contact to address these problems. And I just want to add editorially that we are serious about this as something that is needed now. We have great confidence in the working group and the process toward a permitting system, but that is still down the line, and we have the urgencies of neighborhood disruptions um, on the long weekends from Thursday to Sunday and sometimes during the week. So that this, I also need to remind you, and I think that not the, I think the entire select board has not had the opportunity to hear the recent study by town meeting member and University of Massachusetts Professor Rolf Kallstrom about nuisance house rentals in the fearing Lincoln and Sunset southern perimeter of campus. This study documents, and this is a limited area, but it's a very solid empirical study of that area, that all of the chronic nuisance houses in the district are not owner-occupied, while none of the non-owner-occupied student rentals in that house are nuisance houses. We even found in one case of an owner-occupied house that when the owner was away for several years, there were nuisance calls. When the owner came back, there weren't. Uh, I'm not talking about causal relationships, but I think we know there's a strong association, and I think we can speculate why. Uh, you also know that a nuisance house is described in the general bylaws of the town as a house with a record of nuisance calls, of neighborhood calls. And there we don't mean calls to help me because I fell off a ladder or because uh, I have a personal emergency. These are calls made by neighbors designated to specific addresses because of nuisance that is going on in that address. 
and nuisance by definition then becomes more than one or two such calls. And we talk about this again in our Article 19. So it follows that on the immediate perimeter of campus, non-owner occupied converted two or more unit rentals are magnets for chronic nuisance behavior. Now let me also say, as I noted uh, earlier, uh, that we turned the that we crafted and turned these articles in on September September 19th, while the discussions with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board are ongoing. Uh, we are certainly flexible in coming up what is uh, with what is the most effective, useful language when we get to the floor of town meeting. We understand that we cannot make changes in these uh, because of the you know 150 or more signatures that we had to these this particular language. But as we work with the Zoning Subcommittee and the Planning Board, we may be uh, suggesting amendments on the floor of town meeting. I know that uh, that doesn't help you with your deliberations here, but I think you need to understand the uh, situation in which we are uh, making these petition articles. Thank you. Questions or comments from Select Board about Article 17? No? I have a question. Um, section 12, which talks about an enforcement action that is very unusual and not standard in the zoning bylaw, how that is expressed. Um, did you get any sense of whether that was going to be uh, enforceable in this way? Did you get any advice from anyone about whether this would we're, we're in the process of getting feedback about, uh, let me say that there are two uh, I items here. I should note that 10 we discovered uh, after we had turned it in and had some further deliberations that 10 is redundant in that there is landscaping language elsewhere and uh, it was pointed out to us that it doesn't make sense to be redundant in one article and not in others. So that might certainly be one that we may remove. Uh, just a bit of, uh, th th the short answer is that we are still in discussion about whether we are going to go forward with 12, whether shall, should be, may, how exactly we want to deal with it. Uh, you will understand that we have been frustrated with the difficulties of enforcing zoning. We do know that uh, zoning violations. We do know that the permit uh, that we're looking to as the perfect down the line may have very strong enforcement language because once you have a permit, you can also remove a permit, whereas the zoning enforcement is more complicated. But I think that it may be that 12 expresses the frustration of the coalition about the difficulties of enforcement and the sometimes the slowness of response and how exactly we will handle 12 is still under discussion. Okay, Ms. Brewer. I think this is an excellent example of why we normally depend so heavily on the planning board's reports on these items because this is something that, as you say, is something very different than is in the rest of the zoning bylaw as in making it happen um, in a certain way. So that without better legal guidance on what that means, that is awkward. Other questions or comments? Mr. Heaton? Yeah, just a, a technical question. What permit? I don't see where the permit. I, I was I was looking ahead to the permit bylaw that we are anticipating in the future. At the moment, there's nothing to remove for uh, wayward landlords, and if I may, just um, I hope not in the defensive mode, but note that we were taking the unusual step of forming a citizen coalition so that we could interact with uh, those who have more legal knowledge than we do, but that we could take certain initiatives that might not be possible to have taken otherwise. So. Um. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Um, it, I have one question, I'm sorry. Um, for the section one, so the, the big change is that you're saying that it absolutely has to be owner occupied. Yes, that's it what we're saying for conversions. I mean, we, you know that we're talking about conversions here, which is, you, you know, kind of a, a, a white elephant being subdivided or possibly added to by ba about 20%. But we're looking at large houses in the neighborhood and we're saying that when they are converted into, into duplexes or triplexes, we are saying that they should be owner occupied. And we're saying that for someone who wants to do that with their own home in order to get greater income from the second or third unit, the person would be by definition 
the owner occupying the home. So uh, we did not see that that was a particular liability for the owner, and we did see it as a major deterrent to the out-of-town LLCs buying these houses for, um, uh, for commercial purposes. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's any potential unintended consequences from an affordable housing standpoint. We're always talking about trying to increase the ability of, you know, um, of workforce housing and and uh, lower income level housing in Amherst. So if that, you know, w we focus on the students a mm -hmm. lot because students are a, a very big pressure on our housing stock for sure. But I'm just wondering if, if that has been thought through to its potential for um, I suspect for that that could come up on Wednesday when we have a very thorough hearing with the Zoning Subcommittee and the Planning Board. And let me add that since we cannot designate categories of student, of, of, of either owners or occupants, uh, it, it may be that it's possible with the permitting language down the line to have transiency, kind of annual turnovers as some kind of a rental category. Uh, because again, without wanting to name students as a category, it is true that where we have nuisance houses, it's because they are out of control commercial rentals that are also serving as a magnet for large numbers of other people looking for parties. So we don't see this in the case of older, mature, more mature working people. Mr. Wild. I, I appreciate that too because I, mean, I think <coughs> it stands to reason on the, on the grounds of impressionic, impressionistic evidence and common sense that owner occupied is beneficial in certain ways. If I'm renting, I don't want it to be animal house. It's fairly obvious. But I guess my question would be then to pick up on Ms. O'Keefe's point, w if the issue is more behavior then, why not regulate through enforcement? Nuisance houses are illegal. Why, why approach the problem from this direction as opposed to better enforcement of behavior of actual people who live in houses? Well, we, have, we have been, as, you, as I've noted, and we'll come back to this on 19, we've been frustrated about the speed or reliability of enforcement. And I don't know that that's just a staff difficulty, kind of lack of staff. I suspect that there are difficulties with zoning bylaws themselves that are difficult to enforce and that can lead to a great deal of litigation by LLC owners who are well represented on the legal side. So I think that what we're what was in our minds, or at least I'm speaking for myself, what was in my mind, was not to make it so easy to create the conditions that lead to the behavior. Our focus is not so much on student behavior. Our focus is more on the conditions of overcrowding, non-supervision, non-regulation that lead to these situations. And we're trying to change the facts on the ground that make it so easy to have these kind of houses. But you're conflating several issues. It was overcrowding the numbers of the issue. You're talking about behaviors. so. Those aren't the same thing. And I guess if I were worried about enforcement, I would figure that out before I tried to rezone the town. Um, I'm just not sure that's the best way to go about it. Okay. We, as I said, we were working from data that suggested that this was a very strong predictor of behavior, even though it might not be causally related. Okay. Other questions or comments from Select Board? So the only other information that we'll get between now and our next meeting is going to be, again, uh, some interpretation and extra information from Planning Board. Okay. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. Continue. Previous structures. Stop. You've been trying to explain that. Benson O'Connor, um, um, Summer Street, and uh, Precinct One Town Meeting Member. And uh, as uh, this is even a more uh, difficult situation in terms of uh, you trying to interact with us because um, we have. The planning board has rejected and we have abandoned the, the article that's on the warrant um, in favor of an effort to um, limit the scope of what was originally proposed, which was quite broad. 
And um, so, and, and this occurs in the context of, of two uh, situations. One, one was that uh, an entire streetscape in North Amherst was proposed uh, for demolition uh, uh, to be replaced by a multi-story um, uh, apartment buildings that in all likelihood would have primarily housed students. And, and so that threat um, and, the, uh, and the efforts to demolish uh, 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 outbuildings and so forth to accommodate additional housing units um, provoke this, although I think there's, there's always in the background, um, as, as some of us are aware, the, th the possibility that we might be subject in town to the same types of situations that have occurred elsewhere where um, houses on large lots are purchased and then th uh, the existing structures are knocked down and replaced by McMansions or you know things that are in terms of the streetscape and neighborhood and so forth are are really out of scale and and so forth. So the um, the proposal that that we had uh, you know because we left the planning board hearing on this article. Um, having said to the planning board, which uh, that one we were we were not going to go forward with <coughs> the the article as as it was in the warrant because we realized it was too restricted. Even as we s gathered signatures, people brought up, "What about this?" So we've tried to make and and one property owner in North Amherst made a very um, uh, cogent. Uh, expressed a very cogent concern about um, uh, her property, which was not in a residential district, but is in a commercial district and would have not, and, and building uh, you know, apartments, multifamily housing on that thing, would not have been inappropriate for the district or for the neighborhood because it would not have resulted in the destruction of, of a streetscape, it would have probably improve the existing streetscape on, on a nearby street that is somewhat in, uh, you know, disorder. Um, and so I can say that we have um, in, the, in the text, and I can give you so that each of you have, um, each duo of you have uh, a copy that you might share. I think we could share. Yeah. <laughs> So we've, um, our limitations are that we're going to propose to restrict this to residential zoning districts um, and that um, <coughs> we are, um, uh, and that, and, and this is in response to both comments from the planning board and comments that uh, some of us who circulated the petition heard, we're going to provide a, uh, a means by which a housing unit or, or a structure in a residential zoning district, which is, um, you could think of it, for example, of a, like Lincoln Avenue, there, was, there might be like a small uh, Cape Cod house that is sort of actually in its placement out of character with the existing neighborhood. It might have been there before the houses, but it doesn't have any particular historic significance or whatever as, as might be determined by the historical commission. And th that would be ripe for replacement by a, a more significant residential structure. Um, and we, we've, so we've tried to provide for that, um, uh, for that exception. And but we've also tried to create an exception where if the, the select board in accordance with the appropriate chapter of the Massachusetts General Laws has appointed a local historic district committee um, that while that committee is in operation um, and we might want to get absolutely more focused language, uh, we think that 
in all likelihood, we should maintain the status quo while the committee deliberates on what, uh, what area should be included in the local historic district and um, investigates as part of its charge um, the historical character of, of, of uh, structures that might be uh, not yet in a national register historic district but would be appropriate to include in a local historic district. So we've, we've tried to protect the local historic district committee s deliberations while um, opening up the opportunity for, uh, uh, for replacement of existing housing um, by, uh, you know, by more significant structures um, in cases where the, the, the structure, whether it's a residential or non-residential structure. It, and it, there's also a question of whether we want to say structure or dwelling unit, a residential structure. Um, in essence, we, this is the kind of discussion we we're going to have at 5 o'clock, not at 7 o'clock on Friday with the zoning subcommittee. <coughs> um, because there are instances where I think it would be, um, I as a, in a preservation mode, where we would want to, and the town would want to encourage um, the reuse of, of outbuildings and so forth, perhaps as um, uh, garages and storage areas, uh, at which some of us who live near the, some of these rental, uh, single family and duplex rentals, realize that there's, there's uh, often a lack of adequate storage on site. And so we want to encourage them and also to sort of maintain the existing historic character, even though the, the structure itself might be being changed from what it used to be to some to some other use, including the residential use. So that's the, that's the purpose. Thank and you. I, I have a technical question for you. Um, because the original article is so broad, maybe by definition narrowing it down is yes. still within the scope of the article, but have you run it by the moderator? We haven't yet. That's one of the things we want to do before Wednesday. And, uh, um, and we, we, do, we have a version of this from Mr. Tucker. Um, well, I don't think the planning board has had a chance to see our proposal. Um, so we're going to we're going to hopefully run both versions by the moderator and see which of the components he feels uh, would be appropriate, and then we're going to discuss which ones we would like to advocate for, and um, and we'll hear from the planning board on which ones they're comfortable for. But I think we've we we've addressed um, most of the concerns that were expressed by the planning board and and uh, as were expressed to us. Um, as petitioners. Um, so is the planning board going to reconsider this? They've public hearing to this already, right? Right, but um, the, we're going to go to the zoning subcommittee with the, because we want the planning board to know and consider what language we are going to move on the floor of town meeting. Right. We don't want to have them walk in on, you know, some night in December and, uh, and never have had a chance to either see or, um, or consider uh, this language, even though we may have run it by the moderator. So, so they, I'm sure they appreciate that, as do we. Um, yeah. So do you know if they plan to do that in advance of town meeting? Um, I, I think they would, but because this article is late enough on the warrant, we, it may be considered at a, again, I, their schedule uh, on, on, uh, on Wednesday is going to be pretty tight. Uh, so that there is a possibility that would be considered at a later meeting, but I would hope that uh, you could get a report from them on the language we're going to s we're going to move, so that we can all at least be talking about the same thing. Okay, so you you're know? saying this this language here is under consideration, but you're not sure if that's what you're going to. Yeah, we, we I mean all the details. Uh, some of it is we want to make sure the words all say what we want to mean. We want to consider the proposed wording that Mr. Tucker has has us uh, has responded uh, has produced in response to this, and so um, it's you know I, I, this is one of the um, this is a circumstance where I think. Uh, unfortunately, you're, you're, um, it, it's very difficult for you to, 
uh, act, <laughs> given that the planning board is, has not had okay. a chance to see this. So then, uh, considering the, the state of flux this particular article is in, uh, does select board members have questions or comments for Mr. O'Connor that will help us when we have more information? Mr. Wald. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading this off the top of my head, which is also bruised and has 12 stitches in another oh part God. of it. Oh my God, sorry about um, that. I'm alternately confused and intrigued, I think, because I understand what Mr. O'Connor is trying to do. And certainly teardowns are a really serious problem affecting neighborhood character around the country, not yeah. just here, in fact, much so more elsewhere. This is a chance to try to do something before the problem occurs right. and, and to have something in place. I mean, I guess a, a few things I would say by way of caution, uh, and Mr. Tucker knows this and has probably told you, you know, that historic preservation regulations have to do with the parents, not you, so those are separate things. and that. The fact a structure is found significant does not prevent its demolition in either a normal situation or a local historic district. You know, it's sort of a it's a it's a touch wire, but it's not a it's not a it's not an absolute barrier. And, and that's why we didn't we didn't want to replicate right. Article th uh, 13 of the bylaw, which talks about demolition right. and and provides <coughs> for a, a year set off. What we're ta what we're concerned about is to is to essentially um, guide the replacement in <coughs> such a way right. that maybe demolition would be, um, f uh, it would give uh, the, the town a way to get people to think twice about demolition even after the year was up mm -hmm. if, if they knew that what they could put in in replacement uh, uh, would be limited. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, you know, that's why we didn't want to address the demolition issue because that's yeah. already addressed uh, significantly yeah. elsewhere in the bylaw. I guess that's the other thing that kind of blends the demolition delay bylaw and the local historic district bylaw. I think what you're trying to capture is something from the local historic district bylaw because, for example, uh, you cite the case of 290 Lincoln Avenue, which was found not significant and a demolition permit was, permit, uh, a demolition permit was granted and I gather maybe carried out soon, under a local historic district bylaw, you actually could prevent demolition of a building if it impacted the viewscape. Yeah. So I think that's what and you're so trying to get at. And so that's one of the reasons yeah. to try to, to preserve the status quo why, while a local right. historic district committee is considering, uh, making, considering what recommendations it might make to town meeting yeah. regarding both the scope mm -hmm. of the local historic district and the nature of the protection that they might want to recommend. Because yeah. that's sort of the obvious one with the law in place, but it takes time to establish. Yeah. And then I guess the other consideration, again, with which Mr. Tucker and Mr. Malloy can deal with is how one tries to blend things like this. The other thing you might do is look at alternate uh, models. There are some things like types of neighborhood regulations which might not have the same power but might be more effective than this mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. existing in various communities, large and small. And uh, again, we don't know if, we, if the planning board is going to have time to consider this on Wednesday, but we, we, we are going <coughs> to stay in dialogue with the zoning subcommittee and then hopefully again the planning board so that when you get their recommendation, we'll know what our language is going to be. You'll have their recommendation on the language that's going to be moved the moderator will have seen it, and then you can consider your recommendation based on what's actually going to be presented to town meeting instead of uh, something that's at this point somewhat in flux. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, could, if I could make a, uh, just a comment about affordability and so forth, I, I just wanted to point <coughs> out to the board that one of the, as a tenant and somebody who's been involved in affordable housing for a very long time, one of the things about the previous article about the owner occupant uh, requiring owner occupancy for conversions that I thought was beneficial is that it would um, limit the market to, it, it would sort of skew the market in favor of families and it would create a situation where families might not only have an advantage in purchasing homes but, and, and being able to finance the home through an additional unit, but that increase in density um, would be, f would which I think the you and the planning board really are concerned about, would be much more likely to be accepted by the neighborhood if that increased density was in the context of essentially adult supervision. And I think that uh, if 
so I think in this case, behavior control and, um, and affordability sort of go hand in hand. Increased density, behavior control, and affordability are all advanced by having, um, by having owner occupancy uh, rather than uh, commercial activity. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Article 19. I'm Melissa Perot from Summer Street, Precinct 1. We have a very good nuisance bylaw existing. It was approved by the annual town meeting in the spring of 2008. Since then, the Amherst Police Department, sometimes assisted by UMass Police, have been diligent in addressing the issue of disturbances, predominantly by students living in unsupervised housing in our residential neighborhoods. These have escalated over the years despite numerous additional approaches to the problem to the town, by the town and university, but the issue <coughs> continues to grow with larger gatherings in hundreds and with increasing violence requiring a greater police presence. The Amherst police force has been increased to cope with the number of arrests that now occur regularly in residential neighborhoods on weekends. And some town residents have had to hire their own security guard in order to gain some <coughs> order in their surroundings. It is this situation that has brought our attention to the existing nuisance bylaw. And we're proposing some amendments um, to help implement that bylaw. And so the purpose is to extend the liability which is focused now on tenants and property owners to rental housing management companies and organizations for which we have given a de definition. It's evident that while finding students might deter those few from repeat offenses, it does not deter the overall student population. Owner-occupied and well-managed properties do not generally become a nuisance. And I quote again Ralph Carlstrom's um, compelling PowerPoint presentation. This is the only real change that we've asked to make to this um, nuisance house uh, bylaw. Number two and three are really um, to ensure that what is said there actually happens. So we want to ensure that management companies and property owners are notified of violations as proposed in the 2008 bylaw by designating a town official responsible for sending out those letters which, and providing with that the date, time, and nature of the violations and the names of those arrested who are living at the property so that the property owners and rental management companies can make appropriate adjustments to their enforcement of their leases. The manager's office was proposed in the amendment, but following conversations with the police chief and the town manager, they agreed to assign the responsibility to the police department. <coughs> and we will make that amendment from the floor, along with the addition that the date, time, and nature of the violations and the names of those arrested who are living at the property also be included in the letter because we've had some comment from, from uh, landlords that that was not necessarily there and it made it impossible them to follow up. And the third, third um, point is to create and disseminate to property owners and management companies <coughs> a schedule of response costs developed by the select board as required in the original bylaw and to apply said costs on the first and sub subsequent violations by changing May to shall in uh, sections four, five, six, and seven of the existing bylaw. And that's all we would like to do. Thank you. John. Very much. Did you want to ask questions or? Uh, if proceed? you'd like to add more to the presentation, please go ahead. John Fox, uh, Bering Street, Precinct 10. Um, first of all, I would like to make a, just a general comment. Um, 
to commend the planning board, the planning director, uh, for really trying to listening to the concerns we have. And while we don't agree upon everything, we really see a, <coughs> a welcoming of our ideas and openness, and, and it's a, been a much more collaborative and encouraging uh, process. So uh, we're very grateful for that and glad to see it. Um, let me make a, a statement which I think kind of captures all of these warrants and the issues that you've been uh, talking about with the planning board. I think the great question for you to decide is how urgent these concerns are. What is the trajectory of the changes in the neighborhoods and how dangerous are these changes to the very character of the neighborhoods? So if you believe that, well, as you suggested, Ms. O'Keefe, that maybe we're in special times, we don't really know what will happen in the future. Um, well, that's true, we aren't gonna know. I remember a stockbroker explaining some, to some investors if she only knew tomorrow's news, she could make us all a lot of money. And so we don't know tomorrow's news, but we do know a good deal. And what we do know is that Bernard Bernanke has said that the Federal Reserve is gonna keep these interest rates at virtually zero. The mortgage interest rates are gonna remain very low for a long time. And that people with substantial money from outside of Amherst, not interested in the welfare of these residential family neighborhoods, are going to buy up every single house they can get their hands on. They can offer more than the asking price, they come in with the cash, and they're prepared to do it. And it's happening at a speed I would suggest and argue for all of you to consider that doesn't allow for simply the orderly uh, uh, transfer over to a permitting system. When you think about a permitting system, which I think could have real teeth, and I'm encouraged to believe that it will have real teeth, but that permitting system is dealing with, I think I'm correct, Mr. Tucker, is it 3,500 units, rental units? 3,400, something like that. A huge number of rental units. So you think about a permitting system that may go into effect um, if adopted by the Springtown meeting maybe in the fall, a year from now. And then you just begin a process. So project what this neighborhood is, the, the RG neighborhood would look like a year from now, two years from now. Look at Rolf Karlstrom's data on how fast this is occurring. I would suggest to you that a real brush fire is occurring and that the fire is growing and growing. That the danger is, as they say in the law, clear and present. And so as you consider all of these, all of these particular bylaws, that you realize we don't really have time on our side. Time is not on our side. And the changes are transformative. Uh, we are, I think, at a tipping point in our neighborhood. We're still a family neighborhood. We still have lots of children. And we think we're a great place to live, a great place for faculty and administrative people from the university to live. But it's becoming increasingly demanding on people who are living there, particularly a lot of older people who live alone or, or, or don't have young people, uh, family people to help them out, to live where their party's going on, which keep them up till two and three in the morning, which are so disruptive. So in general, I hope you will yourselves look at the projection of how these transformations are going to occur in the next few years and how urgent it is to take on the recommendations for further bylaws. And along those lines, I, and I'm gonna give this to Mr. Tucker, I, I just discovered tonight, uh, before we came over, a Norman, Oklahoma bylaw. I think it's a bylaw, it doesn't say bylaw, I think it's a bylaw, but Norman, Oklahoma is where the University of Oklahoma is. Um, and the question that you've asked tonight often is <coughs> should we have a hammer or should we do something more delicate? Well, by God, they have a sledgehammer. <laughs> they have something called a nuisance party. And let me just read a little bit to you, and I'll give it to Mr. Tucker, and you can all obviously see it. It says, no person, owner, occupant, tenant, or other person in possession, control, or having responsibility for, individually or jointly with others, of any premises shall sponsor, conduct, host, allow, or permit a social gathering or party on the premises which is or becomes a public nuisance. 
And it says, a social gathering shall be deemed to constitute a public nuisance when, by reason of the conduct, uh, it results in three or more particular violations. And they are the obvious ones. It goes on for, you, I can only show you a whole page of them, but it includes things like noises prohibited, uh, drinking intoxicating beverages, possession of alcohol beverages, furnishing alcohol beverages, disturbing the peace, unlawful assembly, littering. So you just find three of these and you are in violation. It then goes on to list the, and, and, and it's long here, it, the response costs that can be charged. And it says response costs are the costs associated with responses by law enforcement, fire, and other emergency responses providers to a gathering, including but not limited to salaries and benefits of the few enforcement code enforcement of, the, of, of law enforcement, code enforcement, fire, or other emergency responses, salary and benefits. Mr. Fox, I have to interrupt you. Um, thank you very much for this, and I appreciate you passing it on to Mr. Tucker. Um, but it's very late now, and, and what we consider in the future is, uh, is, will be exciting uh, well, for I then. Can, but if I can just conclude then, what, what this goes on to say is that these can be both civil and criminal penalties. So we're not asking in this nuisance for anything like what is, being, uh, what is the law in Norman, Oklahoma. It's much softer, but we think it's absolutely the minimum requirement to hold the property manager responsible for the conduct of the tenants. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're not asking for anything more than has already been approved in the existing nuisance bylaw, except to extend it to the management company. Yep. And uh, just to be clear, um, the management companies are already all notified about any police uh, uh, situation at the properties. It's the managers as well as the property owners get those notifications. So. I have a problem with that. Mr. Musanti. Yeah, I would just add that uh, um, this is one of many subjects that I have met with uh, representatives of, of this group, including most of you here. Uh, and I pledged in our meeting last week that we would build upon the discussions that have already taken place uh, with myself and you directly with our police chief to see what might be possible in a motion at this town meeting that would we could all recommend in uh, in support but there are there are some open issues um, that need to be worked out but you know we think there's some possibilities to work it out satisfactorily okay questions or comments from select board Ms. Brewer I have several um, let me preface it with and, and I think the town manager just segued nicely on that obviously this is not a zoning issue and so it's not the planning board who's going to be giving us recommendations and so are we going to be getting something from you as the town manager is it we're expecting something from the Board of Health separately or are you just kind of combining all those things and you'll get us a report on this particular uh, I'll uh, I'll get a, you a recommendation that has input from all of those parties including the, the neighborhood group the petitioners great and then I, I wanted to point out that I want to make sure I'm clear on the way the language is laid out in terms of adding in boldface and deleting underlined I would actually argue that there are some substantial differences in the changes that are underlined um, in terms of removing language for example on page 18 it refers to a significant segment of a neighborhood being removed, which I assume means if that annoys one person next door, means that would be okay. Um, and also on page 20, uh, two points within letter A. One is clearly trying to protect, uh, you know, initially was trying to protect property owners by saying if the town didn't get their act together and send the letters in the right amount of time, then they really couldn't be blamed. Um, and so it appears to be taking that out. And then even perhaps what strikes me as odd, but I'm looking for an explanation on, is that the owner of the property would not be responsible for any violation of penalties if they're actively trying to evict. I would think that would be something we'd be trying to encourage, so I'm not sure why we would continue to penalize people if they were actively trying to evict. So do we have any that additional it, Those are all examples that are part of our ongoing, ongoing discussion. discussion. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Okay. Um, okay. So let me just see one thing I was going to comment on. 
Um, one thing I was interested in, in the bold print was the uh, about <coughs> it having the date, time, nature of the violations, the names of those arrested who are living at the property. Um, I wouldn't want to do anything that would make it harder for the police to issue the violation. So this is something, one of the reasons that we created Nuisance House and um, that we created various and, and improved different town bylaws is to make them ticketable offenses as opposed to arrestable offenses because it's easier to issue a ticket. Arresting can be hard. Um, if, they, if the police are in any way dissuaded from issuing the ticket because they've got to get a bunch of information together, which somebody might then claim afterwards, oh, sorry, that information wasn't valid, so that ticket isn't valid, I, I would be concerned about that as an unintended consequence. So um, as Mr. Musanti talks with the police chief and others about that, um, the idea of, of really getting the names of the folks who are living at the property and making sure that matches up with whatever goes to the property managers or whatever, I think, I think that that could be, um, that could weaken rather than strengthen this, and, I'm, and I know that that's not your intent. Um, that was my only comment on the specifics of this, awaiting for the recommendation. Any other questions or comments from staff? Okay, and we're done with those. Um, I apologize for asking the planning folks to stay, uh, Mr. Crowner and Mr. Tucker, because we didn't end up asking you any questions about the petition articles, but we do anxiously await your <laughs> further recommendations and information that come out of your Wednesday hearing. Um, so select board members, I recommend watching that on television if you might be available or, or showing up for it so that um, and showing up would be a good way to get any other specific questions answered that are raised. Ms. Brewer. I'm sorry, I have an additional question based on this piece of information we were given tonight on Article 19. Um, what you were just referring to in Item 2, where it talks about date, time, and nature of the violations, names of those arrested, where is that in the warrant? Because so the sh that, that's being added on the floor of town meeting was the intention? Okay. All right. Okay. All right, thank you. That's what I was unclear on. Okay. So, Ms. Stein. Um, there are two pieces of paper that we had to share, and could I ask that they be copied and sent to us by email tomorrow? Right. Scanned. Well, and we would, they'll, they'll be in our online packet. It, yeah. They'll end up oh, in the online yeah, packet, but we can, we can email them as but well. But they'll be added to Yeah, you. that's fine. <coughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming in and providing so much good information. Okay, so, um, all right, let's deal with multi-year solar, then we'll deal with the last bullet. So, Mr. Pooler. Solar has a great future in Amherst, and uh, we uh, put together a couple of articles in the draft warrant to uh, promote uh, solar's future. Um, but we thought that two, um, two articles uh, were overdoing it. To go back to one of your analogies, that maybe it was like using a, a cannon to ring a doorbell. Um, so uh, we can, after the board voted on October 15th to approve one of those articles, um, we were discussing uh, the remaining article on a staff level and we consulted with town council and concluded that really uh, there were a few fundamental things we were trying to get done with these articles. Uh, they're listed at the bottom of the memo that I, I gave you, but there's really <coughs> three things. Uh, to allow the town manager to enter into contracts for the town to act as a host customer for solar projects and that means every single um, solar project has to have a host customer. Somebody has to be the intermediary with uh, the local utility. It doesn't mean you have to actually buy the power, but you have to, you can, you, there has to be a host customer. And for uh, Amherst to act as a host customer, the advantage to us is that there are proposals out there, one of which was in the paper the other day, for a project up in North Amherst on some of the Coles property um, where the developer would actually pay the town um, to be the host customer for that. Uh, the second thing that we're trying to do is allow uh, the manager to sign long-term solar power purchase agreements, whether those uh, 
solar arrays are in the town of Amherst or outside of the town of Amherst. When you voted on October 15th, what we were talking about was uh, that article, that portion of this new article that would allow the town manager to buy uh, solar power from other projects. Um, the idea is that with our original plan for the solar project at the landfill, we were looking at 4.75 megawatts of power. And um, as we're looking at how to configure that, and as we're looking to how to deal with some of the neighbors and address some of their concerns, it, it's probably gonna make sense to shrink that footprint some, but we still need <coughs> the full amount of power. Um, and then um, the third thing in both of these instances I is to engage in and participate in the net metering programs that the state has set up so that um, we actually get paid by the utility for any solar power we buy. So um, the long and the short of it in this article is taking those concepts, putting them all into one article, um, and so tonight what we would ask is that um, you would support this revised Article 6, which would replace the, the vote that you took on the 15th and just have one article to move solar forward. And be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So is everybody clear on that? There were two articles on upon further review. It was clear that one article actually, uh, one article with the concepts combined dealt very well and broadly with the town's interests in solar, both to be hosts potentially for um, for private projects uh, and to enter into um, agreements with to purchase power either from within or outside of Amherst. That's what it all boils down to. So this is one blanket authority to the town manager to do all those things, none of which in any way um, impacts the, the ZBA processes and other permitting processes that any kind of solar that were to happen in Amherst would have to go through. It's just the, it's just the ability for the town to um, be a partner in the electricity should it ever be permitted to be um, created. And part of the theory here is just like the uh, town manager doesn't have to come to us before every agreement he gets into with purchasing you know, electricity or, or other utilities from anybody else, w why would we put solar in some different category? So we might as well give him blanket approval, assuming uh, that the town's uh, desire to be solar customers and hosts continues. Mr. Hayden. Hi, I understand um, uh, what it means to enter into a power purchase agreement and um, how net metering works and, and sort of the responsibilities and obligations that come along with those. I'm not so clear on host customer. Okay. Um, does that mean that we have to forward the bills or, or, or what? How does that, what is that? Uh, to be the host customer, under the uh, state net metering rules, um, there are two kinds of projects. There are municipal projects and private projects. Um, and for example, at the, the project that's being proposed for North Amherst, that would, if the town serves as a host customer, it qualifies as a municipal project. Um, it has the advan two advantages. One is that it um, gets you into the queue for municipal projects as opposed to private projects, and that um, there's more um, there's more room if you're in the municipal queue than the private queue. Um, so it's more likely that you're actually going to be able to net meter the project. The the other is that um, the net metering rates are higher for municipal projects. So the agreement... Which uh, means that the ultimate price paid by the customer is less for so the renewable energy. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, the agreement th that we have worked out with uh, these developers in draft form at this point would say that we would act as host customers, but it would be their responsibility to resell the, the uh, electricity to somebody else. In other words, they'd have to find customers, other municipal customers, to actually buy the electricity so the town won't be on the hook um, either financially or administratively to deal with the power. 
So the reason this is before us tonight is because the two, uh, what had been two draft articles were merged into one as the warrant got finalized. We voted on the previous version of this article that left out the other half. They'd since been merged. So in order to have <laughs> our vote be valid, we wanted to present the fact that the, the new article is um, slightly uh, reconfigured and to see if we still want to vote to support it. Do we? We do. Okay, Ms. Stein, we would you like to make a motion? <laughs> sure, I do. <laughs> I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 6, multi year solar agreements. Second. Is that enough of a description? Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't ask for comments. Uh, is, is that enough of a description? Sure. For the agenda, it is uh, for the motion. Okay. Article six. Yeah. What's Article six? Say? Name of the article. That's what the article is okay. called. So that's adequate. Uh, for the discussion, oh, Mr. Eden. One shouldn't judge a book by its cover, I guess. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I believe Mr. Hayden was speaking to that before. Were, are you? I was. Would you still like will? to speak to it? Okay. All right, um, before we get on, Mr. Perkins has been here very patiently all evening, and I really appreciate that. I just want to make sure that these folks in the back, are you w waiting for anything specific that we Exciting. may or may not do, or you're just observing? Good, okay, because every so often folks end up sitting, okay, good. Some, every so often folks end up sitting through the whole meeting and saying, but, 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 I was your taxi license, and you didn't approve me, or something <laughs> like that, so. All right, so then that brings us to, uh, we'll deal with the Olympia Drive one right now. So um, we have Mr. Zomek come up to explain to us. This is something that you folks dealt with at the last meeting. You approved the, uh, the layout as proposed by the select board, and now we have the article for town meeting, which you had a general description of, but we now have a new motion on. Mr. Uh, Zomek. Thank you, Dave Zomek, um, Director of Conservation and Development, and I'm joined by Project Manager for HAP, Rudy Perkins. And um, so um, we, uh, you have uh, in front of you the warrant and, and this concerns Article 7. And in earlier discussions about Article 7, um, we had hoped to do a, a couple of things with Article 7. One is to move forth the acceptance of the public way at Olympia Drive. That was part one of, uh, of Article 7. Part two is to acquire the uh, necessary easements uh, that haven't been acquired yet uh, to, to um, assure that the project would move forward. In recent discussions with HAP, and I'll let Mr. Perkins elaborate more on this in a minute, um, in recent discussions with HAP, with the town manager, with our town council, um, we've really determined that it's probably premature to move forward with the road acceptance at the fall town meeting. And what we'd like to suggest is that we move forward with part of the, of the article which would acquire the easements. Um, and so I believe uh, in a memo or an email from Mr. Musanti, he outlined an amended motion that would achieve that goal. What we'd like to do is um, reaffirm our commitment to our partner, HAP, and reaffirm uh, that town meeting has voted multiple times for this wonderful project, 42 units of affordable housing, um, while providing HAP with the assurances that they need for their funders that the town is proceeding in a logical, rational way in steps to get to that point. Um, so I think I'll turn it over to Mr. Perkins if you want to add a little bit more about the funding piece. I think the, the board might benefit from uh, some broad brush stroke sure. on, the, on the funding. Again, Rudy Perkins from HAP. Um, I think uh, in my July letter to you all, I, I let you know that DHCD had awarded funding, but then informed us that they wanted us to significantly, or attempt to significantly restructure the funding to take advantage of 4% federal low-income housing tax credits, which haven't been used widely enough maybe in our state, but they are also a little trickier to use, <laughs> at least for us. This is a, a new thing for us. And so it's taken more time in complicated back and forth with DHCD and also with two different um, uh, quasi-public entities, mass housing and mass development, which issue the uh, tax-exempt uh, <coughs> financing, bond financing that goes with these 4% credits. We've been, you know, for months now going back and forth 
and now also put in two formal applications, one with mass development and one with mass housing for their particular uh, tax exempt financing piece. And that's all taken more time than we had thought or hoped. So we, we are a few months behind where we thought we would be at this point in time. And when we heard the, the town's concern about taking on the public way so early that you were catching another winter of snow removal potentially on the road and so on while waiting for the funding, we, we thought this might be a good solution. Um, it has the advantage of having us show any funders who are concerned about things like easements and so on, that that authority to acquire those is in place um, so that we don't get the, the funding closing process derailed by something like that. But it also postpones into the spring. Although I would request if you could put uh, that article as early on the, the Springtown meeting as you could so we might have a vote on the public way acceptance early because there is a chance that this will tend to delay the possible start if we have to wait for that public way acceptance to to go forward. Okay, Ms. Stein. I'm a little confused because Article 7 still says to see if the town will vote um, to accept as a public way. So are we going to dismiss this and just pass this motion as written tonight? Um, the recommended motion um, for Article 7 um, uh, includes the portion of the original article that uh, accepted easements, take steps to accept easements. Okay. That would go forward at the November town meeting. Okay. The actual street acceptance portion of that w would be occurring at the spring town meeting early, okay. um, duly noted. Um, so it will be so an amended. So we think it's within the scope and uh, okay. is another good faith, you know, action on the part of part of the town to show progress in this effort um, to get the project completed and get the roadway improved and then ultimately accepted long term. Uh, you've already voted as a select board the intent to lay out the public way. It's been to the planning board, all those kinds of things. Uh, we have a vote recently from the UMass Board of Trustees that the university brought forward about pursuing special legislation from the Commonwealth because this is state-owned land at the present time that where the roadway is. Uh, that process is underway and we're working with our legislators to work that through and our partners at UMass to work that through. Um, so this gets us to the end of the project where we have the affordable units created, we have the roadway improved and the town, uh, you know, or the funding in place for that and the town's in a position to then accept, accept the road. If I might add, um, just to follow up, um, so to Ms. Stein's point, you hadn't voted uh, to support the article yet. We're right. coming to you with a recommended uh, motion to amend the article uh, so prior to that um, we also wanted to make sure um, out of respect for the select board that we came to you first the finance committee has been asking some questions about the road acceptance because of course that comes with some financial uh, uh, responsibility and liability on the town's part so we wanted to come have a, a, a short conversation with you first so that we could then or I could then go back with Mr. Pooler to the finance committee and address some of their questions. We believe this um, um, motion and this amendment to the article will address most of those questions. So, so that makes good sense. Um, the thing about the uh, state legislation, are you at all concerned that um, the sequencing of these things such that our situation could hold you up, that you wouldn't rather have our the town of Amherst's acceptance of this in your pocket and then you only have one other variable to wait for? Well, um, from a developer standpoint, sure, that would be ideal. But um, we're trying to be good partners here with the town. We understand the town had concerns. The advantage of the two uh, easement authorizations is there's really no cost. They just give the select board the authority to acquire the easements. It doesn't compel you to do that at any time. It doesn't become an immediate acquisition of the easements 
whereas uh, my understanding of the, the public way acceptance, then there's an immediate liability for snow removal and so forth. So, um, you know, uh, there, there could be some delays, but on the other hand, the, the, t the time that it's taking to, to get this funding structure in place and everybody on board, my guess is that it will probably be happening about the same time as spring town meeting, the way these things go. So I hope there won't be too much delay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hayden. We need to put any, any connection with this article to what's happening at UMass, a provision recognizing a statement that we do recognize it. Uh, no, that'll certainly be part of our discussion and description of how this fits into the bigger picture, that being one of them, along with the different funding entities, um, but it's not necessary to be part of the article itself. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the amended motion? Sure. Oh, sorry. I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 7, Olympia Drive Street Acceptance still a funny title for us where we're not doing a street acceptance. <laughs> well, it's still warrant article, article title, style. though. Uh, I know, but it's almost like we should change it, but I guess you can't. Okay. With the following motion, that the town authorize the select board to acquire by gift, purchase, and or eminent domain a permanent easement to use Olympia Drive for all purposes for which public ways are used in the town of Amherst and permanent drainage, water, sewer, access, and or other easements related thereto, including without limitation a water and sewer easement in authority way, all are shown on a plan entitled, quote, Roadway Acceptance Plan, Olympia Drive and Authority Way, comma, Amherst, Mass, um, end quote, dated August 23rd, 2012, prepared by Ducet and Associates and on file, incorporated and on file with the town clerk. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Here the title is just wrong, but I guess we just have to go with it. Because that's what the word is. Because that's, that's what the, what the article, article says. I mean, it's, I mean that's, that's Diana's question, I understand. It's, it's, just, it's just not right. <laughs> But and that's I'm, okay. just, I'm just saying the motion as drafted is directly from town council's suggested oh. motion. Right. The motion is correct. I and understand. you're making clear in your motion tonight that you're recommending this article with the following motion. Right. Whatever the name is. It could yeah. be called right. It's just, it's yeah. funny oh, yeah. that it's called the street Save acceptance that when yes. that part's being Kinda. removed. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, moving right along. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming Thank in. Thank you. All right. So then we've got the recommendations from the last time. Do we want to just go through those? You want to just go through them next time? Uh, do they need to discuss them more? Are you prepared to make the recommendations? So these are ones that you considered last time. You didn't have all the materials in front of you, so you wanted extra time. So first of all is OPEB, um, making the rec uh, recommending the uh, appropriation to the OPEB trust fund, Ms. Brewer? I was just going to suggest that while, yes, I'm at this point oh, completely overwhelmed by paper, <laughs> um, <laughs> like you're sitting there with your little pad and I'm going, I got 12 different versions of everything sitting here. Um, I would say that yes, we should do that because then we'll know our assignments and stuff and we'll be okay. set for Monday, that 19th. Right. So that would okay. be good. Article Get three. it over with. Nine. Make the motion super quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> 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 I thought we were going to discuss them first. I just have to find it now. We can make the motion and then we can discuss it. Uh, that's true. Mm. Um, is it on here for motion for article? Which one do you want? The so. OPEP? It's yeah. two of the motion right sheet. right here, the third one down. Okie dokie. I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, article three, other post-employment benefits, Perens OPED and Perens Trust Fund. Second. Further discussion. I'll note that I was not here for the last meeting, um, but uh, I'll say this specifically to this one and more generally to the other ones. Um, I've watched the presentations from the meetings. I uh, have, uh, um, I, I feel qualified to make a vote on this. Would Select Board prefer that I abstain or? No. Uh, no, we've talked about this tons of times. Okay. 
All right. I yeah, none of you talked about it. The material is very thorough here. And, and you right. know, what, the presentation helped comprehend the material, but it's all there. So. Very well. And they weren't, it wasn't a legal public hearing whereby right. this uh, vote is binding. Okay. Very well. Further discussion on Article 3? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Who would Article I would to love that? to speak to that since I have such an opinion on it. I would like to. Yeah. Your, your opinion is you very positive it. as exactly. you've supported it. Exactly. Right? Because now it's oh, positive. I don't know. All right, uh, next one. I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting Article 4 transfer destabilization fund. Mr. Hayden. Second. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the further discussion. <laughs> further discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. I, I could just as easily do that since I'll just be following the Finance Committee anyway. Excellent. Article 7, we did that. Article 9. Oh, who wants to speak oh, to Article 7? Did we do mm -hmm. Article 9? I'll be happy to speak to that. Uh, first, we just did Article 7, which is the Olympia Drive one. Oh, but you were doing that already, Diana. Oh, did you already Olympia have Drive? Yeah. No, we I wasn't. We didn't have anybody assigned to that. But I didn't, okay. Um, sure. <laughs> if you want me to, I will. Okay. Article 7. Good. Then that's Ms. Stein. Um, and then because we, we did that vote already. Yes. All okay. right. So, so now the EPS nine. one? Yes. Okay. I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 9, general bylaw, ban of EPS foam in restaurants. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And I'd be happy to speak to that. Unless somebody is dying to. <laughs> it's all yours. No, it's going to be yours. Okay. All right, Article 10. I move. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to go ahead? I should just That's keep the, moving along. Yeah. I move that the select board approve, recommend, sorry, November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 10, zoning bylaw, public water supply protection. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Who would like to speak to that? I can do that since it's nothing. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> nothing from the select board's point of view. Uh, it's a wonderful article. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. It involves lots of language, lots of legal uh, language. All right. Thank right, you. I'm moving 11. along. <laughs> I move <laughs> that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 11, zoning bylaw, lodging or boarding house definitions. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Who wants lodging and boarding house definitions? I think I can. That's you? You got it. Thank you. And what else? 15. 15. What? 15 is residential zoning definitions. Uh, did we do this? Uh, I accident. It might. The motion might be in the wrong page place page because page one. Page one. Yeah. Page. I'd accidentally page. put it as a bullet as an act of. I tonight. have down that we were to skip it, but that might have been just earlier in the meeting. Two for some reason. I think we, uh, we skipped it. Um, I Oh, I see. Yes. No, I thought we hadn't discussed it that's, today. That's because I erroneously listed it okay. as one of the bullets for the active things we were considering tonight. And so I said okay. that we were going to put all those off. But in fact, you had discussed okay. it last all right. Yes. I so move I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 15, zoning bylaw, residential zoning definitions. Second. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Who would like to speak to residential zoning definitions? Mr. Walls, that's good. You win. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just kind of stepped back. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Walls. Okay, so good. We're up to date. Is that right on the ones uh, that we I think thought? now we're up now, to. 13 and 14, we did vote on tonight. So we could do the, pos no, right? Those tonight. 13 and 14. You're right. We cleaned up from before. And now we did vote on 13 and 14 and haven't yet assigned inbox at work. And we decided okay. to delay 12. Okay. So, right. So 13 and 14. Okay. So we voted on them. So who would like to speak to two family dwellings? Mr. Hayden, it's your big chance for zoning. Yeah. <laughs> Looking over there. I will. All right. Mr. Hayden and uh, <laughs> converted dwellings. All well, these ones are gone, right? Right. Those are his, too. Yeah, so converted dwellings, is, it's similar. You might as well speak to yeah, both of them. I'll do that, too. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> now are we good on all our articles today? Yes. Okay. 
Oh my God, we still have all this work to do. So that brings us to our 815 item. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I thought it was a lot later than it actually is. 1015 so. is just like 15. <laughs> Lucky so. we gained that extra hour the other day, right? That's Can we right, call yeah. that in right now? <laughs> and we're spending it tonight. We're spending it tonight. Okay, so this is a new installment of our budget policy guidelines discussion. Um, I watched that part of your meeting where you talked about this last time. You didn't have any big things to add or change to the document thus far. Ms. Brewer pointed out a, um, the stuff about CDBG, just the capitalization issues and adding the acronym in the first paragraph. I added the um, percentage for the new commercial uh, sector and under the economic development. Um, and I asked you to look at the overall philosophy for FY14. Um, as much as I would rather not do this tonight, considering how late it is, I think that we need to because we know we've just packed a whole bunch of stuff into our next meeting, <laughs> the one that happens before town meeting. So I have carefully read these, and I do not see any changes. If other people do, that's fine. But I really did read them carefully. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, uh, anyone else have thoughts? Mr. Hayden. I just wanted to let you know that I read them as well, and, and I had lots and lots of thoughts, and I thought, eh, eh, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think there are lots of nuances that we may discuss later but you in, in the next this. round. So uh, I wanted, just want to say I appreciate that you know, all of our thoughts have gotten into this and seem to be pretty well. All right, so you're going to kill me because I'm going to raise two points. <laughs> That's no, stop. No. Um, so the first one is... Um, in that first paragraph, we, we've made, and this uh, mostly comes from last year, um, but some of it is carried over even from the year before. And we say uh, at the end of the paragraph, towards the end, right after the italic stuff, it says any revenue in excess of that necessary for level services should be directed at increasing our investment in capital, <coughs> decreasing our long-term health care liability, oh, OPEB, right. blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of our no new spending philosophy, and, and we've had that for a couple of years. I am just throwing this out there. I have a little bit of concern about um, tying our hands in relation to potential new staffing. Now, I don't know if Mr. Musianti has any concept of potential new staffing, but lots of the things that we're talking about, um, the neighborhood issues involve, as we keep talking about, enforcement. Um, the police uh, and fire issues with various things that are going on. That's all a staffing issue. I don't know if Mr. Musanti has any designs on potentially increasing any staffing uh, to be proposed in this budget. We're, we're kind of talking about this without the staffing plan that we've talked about. Um, but if we could come up with a way to add necessary staff, if that were deemed necessary, then do we want to be saying, sorry, this is a year that we don't want to increase staff, when it could be improving our enforcement of the neighborhood issues, the public safety issues, et cetera. So first I'll ask Mr. Musanti what he thinks of that, and then we'll see what you all think. Um, I am in the early throes of evaluating budget requests from departments. Um, in order to submit a balanced budget that will be within uh, the guidelines and your guidelines that you develop will be helpful. I think it does make sense not to tie our hands about consideration of staffing, but having said that, um, given that the revenue growth, while positive, which is positive compared to a few years ago, um, is still modest and you know barely supports we think uh, level services so that in and of itself will make it difficult for any sort of you know material increase in spending above and beyond level services including staffing but uh, the notion of not tying our hands but maybe perhaps including some reference to uh, consideration of that you know if tied to some sort of long-term staffing analysis that you will get at least in part in my budget proposal, I suspect, based on the work uh, we're doing. Um, so I don't think it's a bad idea. It just may not be practical or affordable next round, but why take it entire, entirely off the table? 
for consideration. So thoughts, Ms. Brewer? And then Ms. I, I want to hear the line again mm -hmm. that you think takes it entirely off the table because mm -hmm. I don't think it does. Okay. And, and, and then I'll elaborate if you could. So. Well, you lay out your Level summary services. statement on priorities if there's extra money mm -hmm. and there's no reference to staffing. Right. And, and I, I guess my feeling is it doesn't say it doesn't say no way, no how on staffing. And I would also like to imagine that in addition to potentially tying it to various things, you might find a way to find a little bit of savings to redeploy some other staffing. So there, there might be something that it might push up the need to redesign something else that we're already doing in order to be able to do something else. So I don't want to just have some little, sp I mean, again, we're just doing this on the fly, but I don't want to have some little space that says, if it sounds like a really good idea, when it m my preference might well be, <coughs> if it's a really good idea, then find a way to make it come out of what we're already doing. So I would certainly, we would always entertain wonderful ideas, and I don't think that, I, I think that if it was something new and really important and based on all these various things we've all been talking about, I don't think we'd look at this and say, well, I just don't think we can listen to you describe that to mm -hmm. us because it's not on here. Uh, so I'm a little uncomfortable about about what that might look like. So let me respond before I, uh, I, uh, I call on Ms. Stein. Um, I want to make sure that these are meaningful. So if this is a bunch of platitudes about how we feel about the budget, but then we say, oh, yeah, yeah, but obviously if anything else comes up, then, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it. So we're either saying any new revenue should not be put towards new spending, or we're saying we don't actually feel that strongly about it. So the, the words that we're putting on here, we want to be able to go back to both um, if, if the town manager were to present a budget that said, yeah, but I increased it in these, these important areas because obviously that's really important, then we would want to be able to say, um, actually, we said not so much, so we don't support that. Conversely, we don't want, uh, w he doesn't want to come back to us later and say, you know, it, when we say, how come we're still so understaffed in public safety when his budget comes out on January 16th, and he says, excuse me, you told me no new spending any new revenue had to go towards reserves. So th th we really are giving each other kind of mutual expectations here. Maybe what we need to do is make the wording a little bit more flexible to allow for more flexibility, or maybe we're just committing to this is or isn't the year that we would consider some kind of expansion if it was a beyond, uh, if it took new revenue. Ms. Stein. Um, first of all, I don't have any trouble adding to that sentence um, the word safety public safety um, as a possible place for additional revenue to go. But I would point out that we hired a code enforcement officer without having that in the guidelines, um, just by appropriate management, and that was exactly for. <laughs> that was the previous year. I'm not sure well, what, that, what the guidelines said then. I bet you it wasn't in there. Yeah, I don't know. So, uh, but I don't have any problem with adding towards public safety, which is, I think, the kind of specific hires that would be in your thinking. Um, anyway, Mr. Walden, I'm afraid. Yeah, I guess I'm sort of in between where the chair is and Ms. Brewer is because I, can, I tend to read this as a philosophical statement, but it's also a guideline and it's revised annually. So. <clears throat> I mean, one of my instincts might be to say, you know, sort of like the master plan, the understanding being that in normal circumstances, we direct growth to built up areas, but a large industrial park is going to go to the Patterson property, not to downtown Amherst. You know, it depends on how you understand it. Um, so I guess that's my sort of philosophical rhetorical question. To what extent do we have to be sp specific? Because if we want to talk specific, I guess I'd rather have the town manager tell us it's a, it's a likelihood. Otherwise, I could see a general phrase such as under normal circumstances or what have you. Leave it at that. Okay, Mr. Heaney. I, I, as as I'm reflecting on the conversation here, realize that there, there's a very interesting feature of this philosophy <coughs> in that it's responding directly to a situation that we are in now, and one that's pretty hard to imagine 
being different in the future. That is that we will have 0.04% more money to spend next year. That's not, or barely enough to give us services that we've had and expected over the time. We, so this, this doesn't anticipate something else. Um, so, I, and I don't know if that's a flaw, or if that's just a recognition of what, of where we are. Um, but I uh, would respectfully disagree with uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Stein, that um, um, adding the words, you know, uh, 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 safety personnel is, is tying our hands in a different way. I mean, I heard, a lot of what I heard tonight is gonna demand not more police or fire, but more planning department people. More what? How do planning, planning department, department people. Or inspections yeah. people. Inspection services. Spe or, or potentially or inspect, well, ZBA inspection as well, zoning. but you know, ZBA yeah. support, planning board support, because there's a lot more stuff that those rules. So and I want to be a little bit careful about tying our hands in, in a way. You're absolutely right. Cops and firefighters, important no, to have but I was as thinking many of those as we can, and teachers, and oh yeah, pool attendants, and. No, 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 that's, that's um, not what I meant. So, um, you know, I, 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 this philosophy is responding to our straightened conditions the last four or five years. So, which is okay for that. Now, I guess we're asking ourselves to envision something else. Right, I, as I we watch sequestration sort of lurk. <laughs> Another fear. So uh, that philosophy paragraph, I think, is actually, well, it's a combination of general and specific. That was where a couple of years ago we said, um, oh gosh, what was it that we said specifically a couple of years ago? I can't remember when we first came up with this. Now it's all it's a blur. Um, um, but for example, we included the <coughs> reference to CDBG in here. I mean, right. these are the things that if. Last year we had the information about the pool, recognizing right. that the pool was going to be a new expense. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to get through all of this and then say, like, truly, um, you know, you, well, what happened? You didn't build a new fire station in South Amherst or something. We were expecting you to, well, geez, it wasn't in your guidelines, you know, so it, it's about mm -hmm. being clear. So, so that it, the philosophy should sh change, should be... Um, customized every year to deal with the circumstances. So to make this concrete, this past year we ended up with about half a million dollars more in state revenue than we had expected. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That raises half a million dollars worth of opportunities to spend. Um, we made that very easy by having ha gone through that thought process last year, and we knew that we're not going to spend it. That this was a year that we were going to put that towards reserves or OPEB um, or capital potentially uh, we included in here because the, we knew the economic circumstances were, were such that that was required. If we wanted to do, and so, so that, that was perfectly covered. It, the same situation this year, do we definitely want, if, if we were to get you know, some, some new half a million dollars, do we just want to do that with it or would we be willing to, um, to expand those possibilities? And if we would be willing to expand the possibilities, I think we need to acknowledge that somewhere in here. Ms. Stein. Okay, Professor Stein would like to say, <laughs> That's become a pejorative, and I want to be very <laughs> clear. Uh, not, not the debate I watched. But that's <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, what I was going to say is I think Mr. Hayden is um, interpreting public safety in a very narrow sense because what I meant was in the more general sense of building inspections, in code enforcement, in all those parameters that impact on um, nuisance neighborhoods. And so I could see including that, given the kinds of discussions we've had this evening, that that may be an area where we do need to increase um, if we had extra money, uh, resources for dealing with these problems so that they could be dealt, dealt with more expeditiously. Mr. Reed. I appreciate my estimable colleagues' clarification on that. Um, what I would like to further observe though is that the half a million dollars that came in is not a recurring right. revenue source. And so it would be inappropriate to apply it to a reoccurring cost. Uh, uh, we've made a distinction between those two some in, other, in our rest of our philosophy. 
um, which is giving me an inkling as to maybe what the philosophy should be. <laughs> I mean, yes, we, we can increase our operations if we have the, reven the regular revenue to support a regular increase. These, these, these pleasant surprises are not reliable and should not be used to hire somebody. Thank you. And, and so I, I was trying to uh, simplify the, the instead yeah, of speaking so, hypothetically to speak more uh, specifically, but it, we never would have had a recommendation from this particular right. town manager and finance director to, um, to fund ongoing no, expenses with one-time money. No, so I wouldn't, have, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, um, Me either, but we need to understand it. That's uh, right. And that's a great thing to clarify for folks who are watching this saying, geez, they might've bought police officers with that. No, we wouldn't have because that was one-time money. So that wouldn't right. have even been a consideration, but there are other kinds of spending that you could say is one-time spending that would have been another way of doing this. Um, Mr. Musanti. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate all this. I, I, I would, uh, I think a, a way to, you know, highlight this and be consistent with uh, performance goals that you've laid out for me, you know, separate from the budget guidelines, one of which is a long-term, completing a long-term staffing analysis um, that, you know, that you're open to considering recommendations in that domain, you know, that in a balanced budget, but that are, you know, responsive to a development of a long-term staffing analysis. And, you know, it won't be a dramatic announcement to say that public safety will be, as a, such an important component of what we do, be actively, you know, looked at as part of that analysis. So suppose I try including a sentence that gives us a little more flexibility than, you know, Ms. Brewer might think that it's not necessary. I would put it in the category of can't hurt, might help, and we'll see um, if that satisfies all of us at the next meeting. Are, are we good with that? There's no. Well, yeah. Is Mr. Hayden sorry? good with that? Yeah, well, even though Ms. Klein and, and Mr. Hayden both appreciate it for just the way it was. Yes, I, mean. <laughs> I apologize for, for messing with that. And I, and I have one, Mr. Hayden. <laughs> one more point, too, that I have to make, so I apologize. Um, okay, I don't know how else to do this, uh, and I apologize for missing the last meeting about this, Most which would have been a, best <laughs> a better time to, um, to bring this up. But uh, capital. So I have long felt that select board should maybe have some role in helping to express capital needs. So the, the JCPC, the, the five-year capital plan, is created by departments, et cetera, but how do we weigh in on what if something is not on the plan that should be there? Mr. Musanti is looking at me going, oh my God, what is she gonna say? This is horrible, we didn't <laughs> talk about this. Um, no, so we have talked about this before. So I want to sort of get on the table and I don't know if it should be included here or what, but um, I think that we need to be looking, I think it needs to be expressed somewhere in the long-term capital plan that as a town, especially to be developing our downtown, increasing our tax base, we need to be looking at increasing our parking potential. So that is not currently anywhere on the capital plan. I wonder how the select board would feel about expressing that as a select board priority to get that conversation started. We know that the parking garage as it exists took a ridiculous number of years to get to that point. That was after the conversation started. This conversation hasn't even started yet, so how do you get it on the table to be making <coughs> progress towards some time <coughs> when that will be a reality. So I'm not making a recommendation for a new parking garage or anything like that. I'm saying, would the select board like to go on record as saying that um, a, a long-term capital need needs to be included in the capital plan about downtown parking infrastructure? quarter of 10, no way, Mr. Walt. <laughs> I guess my only question, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I guess my only question would be, do we want to get out in front of particular bodies responsible for that by calling it capital need rather than talking about studying a need? I mean, are we sure that's the actual solution as opposed to redistribution of existing, yes. you know, we've had the conversation a million times every few years. That's just a, a thought, not a 
I, so personally, I think it is. I think that uh-huh. <laughs> I think that the old study, you know, it showed we had adequate parking for now, mm-hmm. and it said it could be even better if you aggregated all these public spaces or privately owned spaces and stuff. Well, that's easy to say, but it was hard to do when that hasn't happened. And now versus the future aren't the same thing. So I think that even the facts on the ground now are vastly different from where they were when that parking mm-hmm. study happened. I think that. Obviously, if you didn't have a study that proved that you mm-hmm. needed a mm-hmm. new parking facility, you wouldn't proceed with it just because it was right, on the capital right. plan. But I think the idea of getting it on the capital plan to formalize and direct some kind of discussion about future parking um, would be a, a, a positive thing to do. Well, that's sort of my question, just where most appropriately to direct the question. Okay. Um, Ms. Stein and then Ms. Burr. I keep thinking what's on the capital list. I keep thinking about the fire station situation. I think just it's so overwhelming even to have it on the list and have it pushed and know that we need desperately to do something. I mean, the downtown fire station has so many problems and then we have the distance issues and that we had the whole report came out, come out on the fire station, what, how many years ago? Four, three? I don't know. It's been a while. Um, I just, I think, I think it's too much for this. Um, I think there are so many issues for capital at this point that just leaving it as, I just think it's more than we need right now. Okay, Ms. Poor. I, I tend to agree with Ms. Stein, um, and I think that the way to go about it, especially if we're particularly convinced that it probably is some sort of capital investment, not just <coughs> redeployment and repainting lines and doing with what we have, um, is that it needs to somehow, and we don't normally create things, so obviously this would be one way of attempting to do that, but I don't think this is the right the right um, tool. I think we do need to find, we do, there does, however, need to be a way that we can, as having people on joint capital planning, bring it forward without it having to have been necessarily an idea somebody else, a, a department actually wants to have happen, but that a body wants to have happen. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to make a proposal. I mean, obviously, you're not going to invent a garage on our own because we're select board members, not engineers. But I, there does need to be a way that it could feed into the capital plan without it having been recommended by somebody else because it does need to be in there mm-hmm. next to the fire station and next to the mowers and next to all the other wonderful things we put in there because we have not all we have we've gotten so much better over the years you know and and I'm not tied closely to it now but just having remembered it from when I was on school committee etc it just keep the process keeps getting better and better and still we would find things that we just didn't think to put on there in terms of ongoing maintenance associated with capital items that is relatively expensive, not just sending somebody out to go look at it, but that actual requires you know, new investment every so often to maintain what we do have. And so I think it's, it's, a meth- it's something that needs to go along with those tools of continuous improvement of our capital plan and that parking does somehow need to come up in that venue as something we should do. So then this is sort of a two-part thought exercise for the future. So you can think whatever you want about uh, parking. Obviously, there's not a big um, sentiment on the select board to, to do anything with that with the guidelines. But, um, but the idea of how do we express ourselves on capital? How do we bring ideas for potential capital stuff? to the table so uh so here and then you know whether it's a discussion as part of our budget process in the fall whether there's another time to do it it reacts to whatever the capital plan is or whatever but um but you can all sort of help us think about how to do that because it it does seem to be maybe a a missing link in all of this mr (coughs) well yeah that's very well taken i didn't mean to sound too negative about the other one it it was a question of of places and we're kind of caught in the middle because you know the library's got a capital budget the schools the police and fire but the Finance Committee does its thing and we do our thing, and so I think formalizing our role request would be good. Now this year, Ms. Stein, for example, uh, proposed increasing the amount allocated to capital, which was a good thing to do, based on what JCPC did, plus our budget guidelines here. But right now there's no formal mechanism, so we're kind of, you know, it depends on who your reps are and what they're doing. Okay. Good. I think we're done with the budget guidelines discussion for this time. I'll bring you a new, hopefully, final (coughs) draft at the next meeting. Town Manager's Report, Mr. Musanti. Okay. <coughs> uh, 
things, and I will talk fast. <laughs> uh, Hurricane Sandy, which was not named after our finance director, but happens to be the next mm -hmm. yes. letter in the alphabet, uh, you know, came through our area or impacted our area last week on the 29th and 30th of October. Uh, we were very fortunate in our region compared to uh, the south coast of New England and certainly the New York, New Jersey area. Uh, I had my uh, emergency uh, management team working in advance. We had good cooperation and communication with, I think, each other and with uh, Western Mass Electric Company in particular uh, before and during the event. Uh, we had relatively less damage here at the peak of the storm on Monday evening. Uh, we had somewhere around 1,000 uh, customers out in town of electricity. That's about 10%. That was reduced very quickly uh, to really, I think we were in the, uh, down to a handful, I think down to one customer even by the following morning on Tuesday. Uh, we had uh, some outages uh, across town, but um, some concentration in North Amherst Monday evening and the power for most of those customers was restored uh, late into that uh, by about 11 o'clock uh, Monday night. I can tell you that uh, for the event, uh, our roads remained passable. We had some trees down, but not a huge number. Uh, there were three uh, that we are aware of that caused damage. Two fell on vehicles and one, one hit a vehicle and a house. Mm. Uh, um, so we were aware of those. Uh, the other trees, our branches that came down were, were moved to the sides of the road and the roads became passable. East Pleasant Street was closed briefly Monday evening to affect a transformer repair related to the power outage. Um, water and sewer were fully operational. Um, um, dispatch uh, staffed up in advance, as did police and fire. Uh, dispatch uh, said they were busiest between 3 and 8 o'clock on Monday uh, with no calls, zero storm-related calls after midnight on Monday night, which was uh, quite fascinating. <laughs> uh, Police reported minimal issues. Uh, most people heeded the advice of us and others to basically hunker down and stay off the roads. So that was that was very helpful. Uh, I closed uh, uh, town offices uh, at noon time on Monday, uh, several hours in advance of the worst of the storm to allow employees to get home, uh, non-essential personnel. Uh, schools were closed on Monday, but we are all open for business Tuesday morning. Um, the regional shelter at Smith Vocational, run by the Red Cross, did open, uh, and they had 26 guests, I'm told, uh, Monday night. I don't have a breakdown of how many, if any, were from Amherst. Uh, we had no requests for rides or anything like that, and we were willing to do that if necessary. Uh, I did give permission to the homeless shelter, the emergency homeless shelter, which was scheduled to open November 1st at First Baptist Church. I did give them permission to open early uh, on Monday uh, evening, and they did. They had six guests uh, protected from the weather that night, and they stayed open during the day on Tuesday and Tuesday night, and then uh, uh, were open Wednesday night as well, and then their regular opening Thursday night the 1st. So that went relatively smoothly, and again, good collaboration, cooperation with Craig's Doors and with our colleagues at First Baptist Church. Um, so uh, um, I also want to acknowledge uh, that uh, we have a good team in place, and we also had excellent work by our line uh, personnel, our DPW crews, water and sewer, uh, the highway crews, the tree crews, uh, um, and staffing of the uh, DPW-related calls. We only had 11 or 12 DPW-related calls during the storm, which was a uh, positively low uh, number. 
We had our facilities uh, team, town and school, working on building security prep, school buildings, town buildings, before and during the storm. Uh, we had our health staff, uh, Julie and her staff, all engaged, uh, answering phones, uh, a answering questions, preparing uh, uh, supplies and planning uh, for cots, et cetera dealing with the regional shelter coordination. Uh, I mentioned the dispatch center. Uh, IT and staff from my office were participating, getting our EOC up and running, uh, and other sharing of information and doing our reverse 911 calls. I made, uh, I believe, three uh, when all was said and done, including a final call. Uh, so a midday call on Monday, a, a status call early Monday night, and a a, what was really mostly a post-mortem call on Tuesday morning. Uh, uh, and then our police and fire staff out on the field responding to calls and dealing with residents. Uh, so, uh, so it was a good response overall, I think. Uh, we're in the kind of post-storm interaction with MEMA about whether the damage that resulted from this storm rises to an, uh, a uh, high enough level to trigger uh, state or federal uh, financial support. Uh, that remains to be seen. We won't know the answer to that for several more weeks, but we're working on that in Guilford Mooring uh, in particular, who has quite a bit of practice now in doing post-storm uh, uh, reimbursement requests uh, is helping pull all that together. So we'll have more on the, in the weeks ahead on whether we get any financial relief. Uh, but our out-of-pocket cost was uh, not too bad. It was very, very low for us, and our public damage was, was low. We're still compiling some of the tree estimates, but we're in pretty good shape. Thank you. Um, I had already emailed to the select board that, uh, that I went by the EOC on uh, <coughs> Monday afternoon for a to just <coughs> listen in on the phone call with Mima and other folks who were giving the latest updates at that point. And, uh, and I was just so impressed by all of the plans and the contingency plans that were made by the entire emergency team. Um, they were thinking several days into the future about all kinds of what ifs could happen. You know, we look back on it now and, and we were so fortunate to have it be a storm that was uh, of little consequence except to those of us who had <laughs> serious <laughs> consequences. Yeah. But, um, but uh, you know, comparatively to our region, um, but the, uh, the staff and the emergency team were, were ready for uh, vastly more than what we got. And uh, I just wanted the select board to know and the public to know um, just how, um, how comforted and, and secure I felt by that. So, uh, and, and kudos to uh, Mr. Musanti and his staff. Mr. Hayden. I, I can't imagine that the value of having such good forecasting, such accurate forecasting, uh, could ever be determined. But um, I just want to point out that, that it's sort of a, a little bit of a catch-22. I mean, great forecasting means that we were able to get ahead of it and reduce our potential damages, and so we can't declare a disaster and get reimbursed. Um, that's one thing. But also, the apparently, the system that uh, allows those forecasts to be made um, is aging and there's a piece of it is about to fail. So I don't know if at some point we may want to um, step up and support legislation to fund a new goes west. I think it's goes west that, that's about to about to come down satellite. So just just okay. Any other questions or comments about the storm response? Okay. Right. Again, as it approached 10 p.m., uh, very <laughs> briefly. Uh, I attended a meeting, uh, I was invited by organizers of a new regional chamber of commerce for Hampshire County. Uh, Suzanne Beck from the Northampton Chamber organized that meeting. We had uh, myself, uh, the town administrator from Hadley, mayors of Northampton and uh, East Hampton there. Uh, Molly Keegan also joined us, who's on the uh, founding board of the regional chamber. We just had a good discussion about what their uh, uh, mission is and how they are meant to uh, uh, supplement and, and complement the existing uh, local chambers, including ours in the Greater Amherst uh, Chamber. 
Um, and it's the whole point of coming up with a more unified regional voice on, you know, chamber-related issues, economic development and otherwise. So it was a good discussion about, uh, I, I expressed a lot of interest in working uh, collaboratively with that group. I know they've been engaging the Amherst Chamber as well, and I, so I think it has great, uh, great promise. Question about that? Uh, next, uh, another exciting uh, uh, anaerobic digester. Uh, this is a uh, 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 effort uh, that the Mass uh, DEP uh, is partnering. Uh, they've been looking at uh, state-owned land uh, to uh, as another way to generate renewable energy in Massachusetts by uh, um, looking at how we might get uh, uh, energy from some of the organic material that's disposed of in our waste stream, which represents over 25% of the waste stream, which is a surprisingly high number. Um, and so they, they have a technology that uh, is in its early stages, but has proven to have some success uh, using a process called anaerobic digestion. And they've identified, they're trying to identify three sites across the state uh, for um, um, public land. And they've identified one site uh, that is on state-owned land. It's technically in Hadley, but it's adjacent to our existing wastewater plant on Mullins Way. So it's on the corner of Mullins Way and uh, uh, Mass Ave. Um, and the uh, two of the primary benefits of that location are, uh, you know, food waste, including a substantial generator of food waste uh, at the university, uh, and wastewater sludge, which is one of our byproducts of our wastewater treatment process that we pay a lot of money to every year to dispose of off-site and sometimes out of state. Um, could conceivably be uh, uh, processed into at this facility and generated into into a renewable energy. So we think that has great promise. Uh, the DEP next step is uh, have some informational meetings out in the community, and we've been talking about having a joint meeting with our uh, neighbors in Hadley. Uh, that would likely occur sometime in the first part of December. The DEP would come back out and uh, we'd have representatives from DEP, uh, UMass, uh, who were at the meeting I attended at UMass along with Hadley. Um, uh, and we'd invite you and other appropriate representatives of the town, planning board, public works, et cetera, uh, to attend. Uh, so I wanted you to let you know, so there's a, there's a feasibility study that will be undertaken. Uh, we'll have a lot of discussions with the state going forward, and they were very constructive dialogue even at this first meeting. Uh, we want to understand all the benefits, but also are there issues uh, that require mitigation, for example, um, related to um, if there is such a facility adjacent to our wastewater plant, are uh, there impacts on our treatment process that might require permit changes or capital investment to accommodate? And how might we partner with our colleagues at the state level to try to move forward on those issues? So I think it has great promise. There's some issues, and we're, uh, we're starting a good dialogue on, on the whole effort. Questions about that? Okay, next, uh, CDBG update. Uh, I am continuing to pursue uh, potential reconsideration of the uh, uh, Department of Housing and Community Development's uh, 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 announcement that we might lose our uh, mini entitlement status with the next grant year beginning next October 1st. Uh, DHCD has released uh, some updated um, 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 summaries of where they are in their process for next year, and that includes 
the notion of uh, the town of Amherst uh, uh, being considered for up to 450,000 of so-called transition funding uh, in the next grant cycle. Now that's basically half of our uh, current year, 900,000. Um, we articulated transition funding as a backup alternative uh, if full-blown reconsideration uh, was not successful of our eligibility. Um, I am going to be continuing to pursue aggressively the notion of reconsideration. Uh, I think the DHCD's announcement is a positive step forward that we kind of have the, uh, the outlines of what a transition option might look, look like uh, financially. Uh, there'd be a uh, grant application for the whole category has been uh, delayed until February. So like we do every year where we, we, we get a, an initial award of a certain amount and then we submit spe uh, specific proposals to spend the money. Uh, that would still occur as part of this February submittal, but it's possible that it'll be in the transition funding category. But we'll still try to see if we can get clarity on reconsideration uh, prior to that. Questions about that? Ms. Brewer. Ms. Brewer is going to comment that she uh, believes that the town manager is not painting the picture quite as bleakly as she thinks it needs to be painted for the CDBG proposal, although I have great faith that he will find a way <laughs> to aggressively <laughs> have them reconsider our position. To give you a better sense of what half means, and I mean the viewing public in addition to all the delightful people here with us tonight, is that that means that we are talking about only $90,000 for social services for a whole year. That's how much the shelter costs when we don't pay as much as it actually needs. So that's one thing, just one. And none of the other agencies getting anything if we look at just the amount that that requires. And it's a huge, obviously a huge cut in um, our capital in particular because it's still a 60-20-20 split no matter how you all, you're always forced to do it that way. It also means um, not only the other agencies that we have such great partnerships with and we've been delighted to be able to fund again, but also just the town of Amherst flexible emergency funds. Those wouldn't even be there either. And when we're talking, you know, $7,000 here, $10,000 there, it's, it's a huge thing. So obviously I'm sure the town manager is working very hard on this I, for many reasons, including that it's going to be difficult to figure out how to accommodate these elsewhere in the budget, but it's it's just sad. Thank you. And CDBG is going to try and get together and have a meeting to decide how they might move forward with prioritizing that, you know, if that is the worst case scenario, which, you know, thank goodness 450 is still better than zero, um, if that is the worst case scenario, how they would prioritize the different proposals they have because they're all up online right now, and of course they have proposals for $700,000 worth of capital and $300,000 worth of social services. So how would they then narrow it down further given the circumstances? Thank you. I would just reinforce that I wasn't trying to sugarcoat anything. Oh, no, just um, is different than sugarcoat. That the, <laughs> you know, this uh, announcement um, appears to show that the worst case isn't 100% cut but it's a 50% cut, still a very severe cut with serious consequences, but it's not as bad as a $900,000 total elimination of the uh, funding for everything in that program. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep at it. Anything else? <coughs> Coming? Uh, no. Okay. While we're on the town manager's report, then let's do the untimed item that we need to do. Um, one of them that we need to do, the one about authorizing the intermunicipal agreement for assessor's services to the town of Pelham. And this is something that you were briefed on at the last meeting. We have a good memo in our packets about this. Um, uh, 
it's pretty straightforward. We've got an arrangement with Pelham by which they will pay us um, prorated this year and then uh, full amount in coming years uh, for us to provide their assessing services. So uh, town council's suggestion is that we need to sign off on this. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I would. I move that the select board authorize the town manager to enter into an intermunicipal agreement with the town of Pelham for the Amherst Assessing Department to provide assessing services to the town of Pelham. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's what unanimous. A great idea. Thank you. Okay, um, let's actually get through the uh, other untimed items that we have to do before we get to the member reports that are, we don't have well, to how do. How about the proclamation? Yes, please. Um, I don't think we have to read it. It's posted online, so I'll just make the motion. I move to proclaim that the select board proclaim November 18th, 2012, Puerto Rican Day, and to permit the Puerto Rican flag to be flown from November 9th, 2012, to November 30th, 2012. Second. For the discussion, Ms. Brewer. Um, the proclamation says November 8th and the motion says November 18th. Yeah, I sent that to um, Ms. So Roussel and she was gonna is. fix the um, signing copy. For, it's supposed to be the 18th. Although it says the 8th, we don't know. Let's say November 8th or the 18th. Well, it's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking it must be later. I was thinking it was closer to Thanksgiving, but. I thought that's. I thought it was the 18th also. Let me just check my email. Because what I was going to tell you was when the um, flag raising is, it's the 9th. I think it's at 3 o'clock. Because that fell during snow. It says it should right? be November 8th. I'm sorry. She she followed up on my email. said it should be November 8th, prepare a revised motion sheet. As the so. actual day. Okay. okay. But we set our hands this fifth day yep that's okay. okay so the the signing copy is correct and we just changed the motion which was not changed to say November 8th that is right. correct Excellent. and let me just tell you about the flag raising while we're on the subject is November 9th at 3 p.m. so that's right oh, yeah. out front here okay further discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. Aye. And do we have to do the Mary Maple? Yes. Um, um, let's talk about the Mary Maple. Um, we can do the Mary Maple thing, the parking thing. We can't do that one yet. That's not even the same as what it is currently, or, or, or I should say what we did last year. Um, so I would rather put that off. Ms. Brewer? Okay. Yes, I was going to ask if we could just do the greeting card day and Mary Maple part, and then that way we'd have the greeting card day. There's no reason to mix all the rest of the stuff in with greeting card day, and just that because that, that motion like is totally not even what we would um, but just so that everybody knew for greeting card day, because that's you know faster than the other stuff. But if you want to put it off too, it just it just it doesn't have to be in the same motion. It's true. It doesn't have to. The only thing I'm thinking is that one of the things that's missing is whether or not there's a um, small business Saturday this year that there was last year, which was the day af uh, uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, which is more like greeting card day, as because those were things that we said town wide versus the other one. So if you wouldn't mind if we just hold off as I figure out with the chamber and the bid and the office what exactly we're doing about all the different parking things for this. Here. And if you could clarify, because like I wrote down three things about the parking, saying no, wrong, uh, uh, no. <laughs> okay, so, so so that you know what we did last year, we did free parking townwide on both greeting card day and the small business Saturday. That I get. And then we also did free parking in the Boltwood garage and in the town portion of the CVS lots Saturdays and Sundays between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So this one starts December 8th. I don't know why. Um, so I, we're just too soon to clarify. Okay. If you have if you have opinions on that, then then let me know as as we form the motion right. for the next time. And but if you just take out the town hall lot, I don't want people parking for free in the town hall lot. That's that's not where we're encouraging parking in the usage. town hall. I don't know why it says that. In the town hall lot, it says. We don't want to use confusing. that as a free parking place. Yeah, I don't know how that ended up. I'm sure okay. you know yeah, what we So need. we'll work on that. So I, we'll I didn't know that one that. was coming forward right now. So yes, if we could do just the Mary Maple street closure one. Okay, so you're not going to worry about greeting card day. You're just going to do the first half? Just, just, the thing with, just the thing with all the bullets, that motion. Okay. Yeah. I move that the select board approve the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce request to close the following streets on Friday, November 30th, 2012, 
for the annual Merry Maple event. Close the Main Street parking lot in front of Town Hall from 12 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Prohibit parking in the Spring Street parking lot north side only from 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Close Boltwood Avenue between Spring Street and Main Street from 12 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Block off part of a lane on North Pleasant Street from the pub restaurant to the town common to allow for horse-drawn carriage rides. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Anything else we have to do tonight? Member reports. Critical need. Uh, I, Everybody's shaking their head. Okay, yeah, no member we'll reports. We'll do them some other yeah. time. <laughs> the chair's report, I have nothing to say in the chair's report except to just to note that letter that was in your thing from the, in your packets from the Water Supply Protection Committee that followed up on a request we made of them to look into whether or not we needed town bylaws regarding looking for natural gas um, underneath Amherst soils and Water Supply Protection Committee said, no, we don't need to. And this was in our packet? Yeah, it was supposed to be. Just to me. Totally foreign. Oh, never mind then. I'll go in your next packet. <laughs> never mind. I, I can say it faster John next time. Confused. It's on the online packet. You're all kind of looking at me. I know why. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think that's everything. Is, does anybody else about. think that there's anything that I've missed here? Mr. Hayden, otherwise, would like to make his motion. I would move to adjourn. And without objection, Second. this meeting <laughs> will adjourn. 30 is just like 930. 1016. 1016. It's not like 930. The next be time we meet is 615 at the middle school on November 19th. Oh, wait a minute. I have to write this down. Uh, town meeting. So. <laughs>